Okay, so I want to go over some of the data that I've collected with the CPU introspection stuff. It's using MLPDS, which is uh, microarchitectural uh, load port sampling, and it allows me to basically see all of the transactions, all of the loads that occur on an Intel processor. Uh, and I go into it in this blog, so if you guys are interested, here is the blog. And I talk a little bit about uh, what my goals are with this research and, and kind of the way I'm going. And I actually need to fix this. Uh, this is a typo here. Um, it's not multi-architectural, it's micro-architectural. Anyways, um, so in the data that I've collected with this, it looks kind of like, uh, they look like normal peaks roughly. So if I go to file home pleb, uh, sushi roll CPU graphing graph.svg. Oh, look at that. First try. Okay. Just need to tend to my tibia characters. Okay. All right. So. In this case, the data that I'm looking at, uh, let me bring this up in new terminals. So we'll do this, main and source CPU research load port snooping. Uh, we'll vertical split that one. Okay. And I'm gonna fix up these new lines because that's gonna be really annoying. Ah, that looks fine there. Okay. And that looks fine there. Oh, boy. I've really uh, gone to shit with my formatting here. And that... I really like the 80 columns. And it's only because I can have multiple of these open kind of side by side like I'm doing right now without having things going over. Okay, so now if both of these are formatted, we can fit two files side by side, even with this large font size. Okay, so I'm going to move that to one. Actually, yeah, I'm going to put that to one. I'm going to move that to three. And then the data that we collect, uh, we're going to put this on two. So we'll open up two stream terms. And I'll go into sushi roll. Uh, this one will be the one that we'll build on, and this will be the one that we parse, uh, runner.py, python parse load sequence.py. Okay, and that doesn't need to be mutable at 151. So what I have is a, a really simple example here where I'm going to go through these virtual addresses, 1337 through 1338, and I'm going to fill them with pointers to the next thing in this list. So effectively, or the next page in this list. So it's a linked list of 16 pages, uh, effectively. So I go through each address in this range. I then write the address plus 4096 to that location. And then I go to the next one, the next one, the next one. And then at 1338, I write a zero, uh, which I technically don't need to do anymore. Um because that will never get accessed. And then down here, this is the code that's being sampled. So this is what I'm able to observe all the loads on between this, this while loop, which is waiting for the like leak thread to be up and ready to leak this information. And then at the end here, we have the end of this kind of spot. So in this entire area, I can sample all of the loads. And we can go through and, and show kind of uh, what I've learned from this environment and things that I've played around with. So since this is completely undefined behavior and everything we're doing here is completely new and, and different, uh, I'm learning how to use this tool because I don't get to dictate how the computer works. Uh, so I have to kind of figure out and learn how to get the best data out of this as possible. So we're going to be looking at trying to do that today. And uh, this is the leak. It's kind of complex. Uh, we can go through that if, if people want to. And I can explain how that works. Um, if that's something people want. 
We've got the delay here. I'm gonna change just a couple parameters here so we can do a quick test to get spun up. And I just wanna show roughly what the data looks like from a quick run. So we're gonna run a six second sampling interval. We're gonna build this and we're gonna ship this out to the server to run. And so this is going to go, it's going to find all the values in that window and then it's going to spend six seconds sampling this information and I'm gonna do this so it fits better on this screen. This is what we care about a little bit more than the, the compiler output. Um, so this is now processing the data and, and making this graph. So now I can go and refresh, the, refresh this graph and it's the data that we just collected. So I'm pretty happy with this workflow. It's a little bit slow in terms of like having to build it and then run this, although I could just have like a cargo run and then uh, do this at the same time. Um, so I might end up making a make file for that to make this uh, development process a little bit more seamless. Uh, right now I'm using, um, I'm using a, all of this uh, data collection is over the serial port, which really sucks because I'm limited to 115k baud. And that, as you saw, there's kind of a delay in this, and that was just waiting for the data to transfer over that serial port. Uh, this is the fallback mode in this kernel if I don't have a NIC that I support. Uh, this server, I don't have a network card I support. I just ordered a right angle bracket because it's a 1U, so I can put a NIC that I do support in there because uh, it's, it's cheaper for me to buy a NIC than write a driver. So I'm just going to buy a NIC so this can have uh, the networking code, and then I'll have my TCP stack and everything. So I can transfer at 10 gigabit rates and just dump data. In fact, eventually I would like to make this real-time and seamless and have like a chart that's kind of always plotting and the data just coming in and splashing on this so I can see what's happening right away and make human decisions uh, instead of waiting for the data to collect and then be sent in a, a compact format. All right, what am I working on? So I am working on uh, a, I, I have a blog on it uh, that I kind of explain a little bit more what I'm doing, um, but effectively, I am collecting data on Intel processors that allows me to see and sequence all of the loads that are occurring on the processor. And that is including things that happen during speculation. And if you're not familiar with speculation, uh, basically your, your CPU is like an assembly line. It's going to uh, take a bunch of orders, which are the operations, the opcodes. It's going to take all of those requests of, I want to add these two numbers. I want to read this from memory. I want to subtract these two numbers and multiply these things and transform this matrix and, and whatever uh, commands you're giving the processor. Now, the processor... Um, often has to wait for things like memory. Like memory takes a really long time to access. So memory is, is uh, I would say like one memory access is about the same cost as doing, uh, let's say a hundred ads. So while you're doing a memory operation and, and those aren't like, the numbers vary of course, based on your computer. Um, but effectively that means that loading from memory is really expensive and the processor kind of has nothing to do if it's waiting for a load to complete. So the processor has this concept of speculation. Uh, and speculation basically allows the processor in silicon, it will, it will save the state, save like everything that it knows about everything. Uh, it's a little bit more complex than that, but let's just say it saves the state of everything. And then it will go and try to access things and do operations beyond the memory access. So if you have a memory access that happens at the start, uh, it sees that there are some ads and operations that are happening after that load and not depending on the result of that memory access. And thus it will go and try to execute those things first. This is called out of order compute uh, or out of order processing. It's pretty common since like 95 and it's just kind of the standard. Uh, but two years ago, actually kind of forever, people have questioned uh, hyper-threading and uh, out-of-order processing in terms of being able to leak secrets. Although two years ago, there were attacks done uh, called Meltdown and Spectre, and those effectively demonstrated that during speculation, the processor has access to resources uh, that you shouldn't in the operating modes. For, ex for example, uh, computers have this concept, or more software has this concept, but computers allow this concept, of user land and kernel land. 
And basically, kernel land is where your operating system and privilege secrets run. And if you have access to that, you have access to the whole computer. It's not like that with hypervisor. Well, who cares? And then user land is like where your applications live. And they're usually isolated by the operating system to, to do separate things. And effectively, uh, during speculation, Meltdown, for example, uh, showed that you could read, you could attempt to access kernel memory, which was not accessible in user land, but during speculation, the processor would actually treat that as a real address and go fetch that, and that would allow during speculation that you could, you could read those values. Now, speculation isn't supposed to be visible at all to a user, so a, a user doesn't like the processor will speculate this and then it'll find out later that it made a mistake, it will go back to the original save state and then continue execution from there. And that's what kind of everything is relied on is that when you reset that state, everything actually gets reset. Uh, but there are a couple exceptions to that. One of the primary ones is caches. So during that speculation, memory loads can be performed or stores that cause memory to be accessed and the processor has to cache these, these accesses because memory is very slow. So it ends up caching these accesses in these caches. Um, and the fact that these caches are limited in their size, they can only have a certain number of bytes from memory cached in them, uh, you can actually tell whether or not something got evicted from cache or whether or not something got brought into cache. And during speculation, those caches are not part of the saved and restored state. And that means that after speculation, you can see cache lines which have been evicted. And people use this to write primitives during a speculative shadow that allow them to uh, leak information from that speculative window. So they basically will read a value. So in speculation land, so let's go through a, a, an example. Um, so uh, test, and that's a real thing. Okay, so in this example, we're just going to write some uh, Intel assembly. Pretty straightforward. I'll explain it. So if you don't know assembly, it'll, it'll still be easy. So we're going to perform a load, which will cause a fault. So we're going to load from... We're going to load from the memory at negative 1. So in 64-bit land, that will get sign extended to FFFF, 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 FFFF. So this is 64 bits of... F's. And this is the address that we're going to read. So we'll just say this. Let adder is equal to that. So we're going to perform a load of that address. Now, um, this doesn't necessarily have to cause a fault. The, this load's actually going to cause an access to uh, two different cache lines, or two different parts of memory, because this FFFF address, when you add one to this, uh, that will not actually be one with a bunch of zeros. Uh, this will turn into um, adder plus one is equal to zero. And the reason for that is this is the largest 64-bit value you can have. So this is, if we go into, um, I need to do this stream term. If we go into Python and do 2 to the 64, that is... 2 to the 64, the number of values that you can hold in a 64-bit value, uh, which is the pointer size on 64-bit uh, systems. If we look at the hexadecimal representation, that's one with a bunch of zeros. Now, that value actually can't be represented as a 64-bit value because zero also has to be represented. So the largest value that you can hold in a 64-bit register is actually this, all Fs, and that's what we have over here. Now, if we take that and we add one to it, you see that we get this large number. But Python actually has a big int library where it handles larger than 64-bit values. But these are the 64-bit aspects of this number. It's, it's the zeros. So in actual silicon, this one will go away. He'll disappear. He'll technically go into a carry flag, but whatever. So um, anyways. So we're going to perform this access, and since this access is a, uh, since we're loading into RAX, and RAX is a 64-bit register, this is actually a 64-bit access. And if we're accessing a 64-bit value, 8 bytes, at this location, 
uh, the last byte that we're going to access is at this address. Uh, technically, uh, is it? Uh, it'll be at this address. Yeah. The last byte. No. It'll be at this address. I, I was right. The off by ones. So we're going to load eight bytes, one byte from FFFFFF, and then seven more bytes from zero to six inclusive. Now the processor is going to split this up and it's gonna perform a split load here uh, because the, the processor kind of buckets everything by cache lines and cache lines are 64 byte things in memory. Um, and it'll, the reason for that is the processor, the processor needs an effective and efficient way of organizing these caches. And it was just kind of decided, probably by like a lot of study and research, that 64 bytes happened to be ideal. It wasn't too big, it wasn't too small, and it allowed memory to be fragmented up into these chunks. So if you had, if you had much larger than 64 byte cache lines, you would end up pulling in hundreds of bytes of memory when you access just one byte in a location in memory. On the opposite side, if you have one byte cache lines, then you're gonna use a lot of cache lines if you wanna just read a 64-bit value, an eight byte value. Okay, so let's say for example that this address is not mapped. This, this memory is not present on the system and thus accessing this memory is going to cause the processor to trigger an exception. Now, what you would expect and what kind of programmatically happens in terms of what is, what is commit architecturally in terms of what like you would see as a programmer, if this fault occurs, it would look, you would get an exception. So this would get diverted. Um, let's just do this. Uh, let's show this, this, and we'll say exception. exception. Uh, we're going to throw this over and that's going to go to some exception handler code, which the OS has defined in its IDT and a bunch of other data structures that basically say, if an exception happens, go execute this code at a privilege level and it'll go figure out if it can handle it. Um, and this is a very common thing that processors do. It happens all the time. So that's going to go to some exception handler, and that's what you would expect. And let's say behind here there's like an add rax8 and uh, uh, compare racks with 5 and a jump uh, if it's equal to label and then label, and this will be like do stuff, and otherwise it will jump to a fall through, which will be like end, and end, let's say it's just a ret for some reason. Whatever, we're making shit up. Okay, so effectively what this code does, uh, this assembly does, is this would add eight, the, the value eight, to the register RAX, that 64-bit value. So whatever got loaded from memory, the 64 bits that were present in memory at this address will get added to, and then that value will get compared with five. And then if that's equal, uh, if if... RAX is equal to five. So basically this value multi or added with eight and then compared with five, if it's equal, it'll go to label and do some stuff. Otherwise it will jump to this location in code and and end execution, return out of the function, who cares? Um, not, this isn't real code. So what you would expect uh, programmatically in terms of what, what memory actually gets touched, uh, what things architecturally get commit, and these sorts of things that, that you care about as a programmer, as someone expecting these machines to behave as machines for you, um, you'd expect this exception to happen and, and so on and so forth. But what the processor actually does is it will execute this instruction and dispatch this memory load. And let's say this memory load is going to take 50 cycles. It's going to spend 50 cycles with this pending. So the processor is going to allocate a resource for this. If we actually look at... Um, And this is going to go to my blog again, I think. Uh, diagram, if I type it correctly. Here we go. Do, 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 do. And the thing that we want is that. Copy image location. Yeah. Okay. 
This is the PNG version and not the SVG version, but but whatever, it, it's it's clear enough. Anyways, so the processor effectively on that load is going to allocate a load buffer entry. And that's basically going to, so it's going to issue this load through either port two or port three. So these are different like places in silicon where the processor can handle loads. So it has a couple things reserved for loads, a couple things for math, a couple things for stores, kind of how the processor is bunched up. It has these different things that can perform different operations. So it's gonna know, of course, that this is a load and it's going to find whichever port is available to handle a load and it's going to issue that UOP to the load. Now that load is going to go and sit in this load buffer and that's basically going to be pending. It's gonna say, I would like to do this load and it will place this in this load buffer, which has 72 entries requesting that this load occurs. Now that's going to have a lot of cache ramifications because now the L1 data cache is going to see that there's a load buffer entry or the load buffer alerts it. I'm not sure which way it goes, but whatever. The L1 data cache will see that a load needs to be filled. Let's say this cache line is not present in this cache and thus it can't fulfill this load yet. So it will then allocate a line fill buffer entry, which will then kind of be similar to the load buffer that's going to say, the L1 cache has requested that this memory is loaded. Once it is loaded, please inform me and fill it in and, and whatever. So there'll be an entry in the load buffer for this load that's pending. The L1 data cache didn't have it, so it made a line fill buffer entry. The L2 cache is going to try and fill that, the L3 cache, so on and so forth. So everyone's going to try and find, they're gonna try and find the fastest access to this memory. They're going to go to the nearest person and ask for that memory. And then if that person doesn't have it, they're going to go find it. And if that person doesn't have it, so it gets more and more expensive as you go up. For example, an L1 access is like four cycles, L2's like 13, and an L3 access is probably in the like 30 to 40 cycle range and a memory access is about 100, well, it couldn't be like 80 to 150 cycles or 250 cycles on, on systems with multiple processors where this communication has to go between processors, not cores, but physical processors. So while that load is pending and that entry has been filled where the processor is waiting for this load to occur, it doesn't know if this memory is valid. It doesn't know if these accesses have... If if this memory is present, it doesn't know what the data is. It doesn't know if it's going to succeed or fail or any of these things. So it's trying to figure that out right now. Now, while that's pending, the processor is just going to go ahead and kind of... Uh, let's actually make it simpler and put these in RBX. The processor is going to recognize that RBX is not where the, the value from this load. So it knows that RBX... It knows the value of RBX from well before, so it doesn't need this load to finish to do operations or math on RBX. So the processor is going to now start looking ahead and performing speculation. So at this point, the like arc a textual state is commit. I know I spelt that wrong, who cares? Um, so the architectural state is commit kind of at that point. And now the processor is going ahead while this load is pending and it's going to perform this arithmetic and these compares and these branches and all these things. And then eventually, let's say this is where the processor is when the load completes. And it's gonna be like, uh-oh, that address was bad. We need an exception. So now the processor is going to unwind. It's not actually going to restore state to a prior state. It's not like it saved off this state before speculation and then it's restoring it. What's actually happening is the processor is doing all these things in temporary spaces. And then as it finds out that these operations were invalid, it will simply just not commit those to the rigid named register. So the processor itself actually has many more registers than the 16 that we're familiar with. Um, and effectively, they're all alias and named. And that's uh, part of like uh, this part of the diagram, uh, renaming the register alias table, those sorts of things. Um, and effectively, that's the part of the, the processor. It, it has a bunch of these registers. In this case, uh, I don't know how many, process, uh, how many registers there are. It looks like 180 registers, 180 integer registers. So effectively, the, 
The processor has all of these registers and it's doing all of these temporary operations in these registers, but it will only ever alias those registers to a real x86 racks, these sorts of registers, once an operation has been validated to be successful. I know we're talking at a very high level here, and you could nitpick all these things and say, well, technically and actually, uh, but that's kind of the, the high level goal of the processor in, in terms of these speculative things. So, there's an issue in Intel processors that I reported, uh, let's say, a while ago. Um, and basically, it is exactly this case. So, in this case, you would expect that if these are racks, that the execution wouldn't actually succeed because these are dependent on this operation, and thus, these operations can't actually continue on because we don't know... We don't know the value of racks, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. So Intel, like I was mentioning earlier, has some special magical circuitry that's kind of required for the processor to handle um, these complex split loads. So these are called uh, like split loads or cache line splits, uh, and it's effectively when the processor needs to pull in two separate cache lines. So it needs to perform two separate accesses and then merge them together in a load. Now, of course, when you implement circuitry like this, uh, it's really difficult. It's, it's a very expensive operation. You want it to be as fast as possible because things like ARM, not technically as true to modern day, but like low power ARM chips or MIPS chips and a lot of RISC architectures don't allow unaligned loads. I know that with ARM64, almost everything allows unaligned loads and it's just standard. Uh, but unaligned loads kind of gave Intel an edge that you could operate on compressed packed data. Uh, yes, there's a penalty for performing these unaligned loads. They're more expensive than a normal aligned load, uh, but it's not significant enough that it necessarily hurts kind of the compacting that you can do by not aligning everything. So this is a big bread and butter and, and kind of monetary win for Intel uh, and just the x86 architecture in general. So the circuitry in here, uh, I don't know the technical details, but effectively when you perform these unaligned loads, uh, instead of blocking and not giving this access memory or just returning zero when speculation happens on a reading value, uh, the processor will actually just kind of go ahead and give you some random data from the load port. Uh, and that is MLPDS. The, the processor performs this load and racks for some reason, even though this address is not even valid, Racks contains the contents of a load that was recently performed on the processor. Now, if you combine that with hyperthreading, you can cause one thread who's using the same resources and load port buffers as your core, and that will go off, and you can have it do kernel things or hypervisory things or privileged things and operate on crypto data, while your core is monitoring that activity and it allows you to see the contents of the loads that this privileged thread are performing. And of course that's an issue because you can use that to leak passwords and secrets and cryptographical keys and whatever you want. So that, in a nutshell, is what we have. So we have a very, very, very uh, well-written, because uh, I wrote it, you know, pat myself on the back. We have a really well-written uh, exploit of this vulnerability, and this allows me to snoop on loads that have happened, loads that have gone through the load port on Intel processors <coughs> at a rate of about uh, like seven or 8,000 64-bit values per second per thread. Now, since I have those like seven or 8,000 values per second, I can now see, I can sample the loads that are occurring on the processor. I can't necessarily pick the order that they go in, but I can sample them to try to determine uh, what has been loaded. And I'm going to use this information to try to learn more about what the processor does and how it behaves. So this uh, this vulnerability is a lot different than Spectre and Meltdown, which allowed you to usually leak uh, kind of L1 cache, like stale things from L1 cache. Load buffers are actually used, or, and the L1 cache, but 
Meltdown Inspector required that you had some existing oracle in silicon, some address, something that you could fetch, some some like known good thing that you could drive the processor to do and leak that information. Uh, MLPDS, this this exploit here, uh, is interesting in that it allows you to actually observe load port traffic. And load port traffic is every load on the processor, including loads that happen during speculation, including loads that are hidden, including loads that are sensitive and not meant to be observed by the processor. They're not dispatched by the processor. So in my blog, I kind of mentioned one simple example that kind of comes up repeated in that when you access memory that hasn't been accessed before, the processor has some special things that it has to do. It has to go and update some of these access bits and structures to basically indicate that this memory has been used. Now, the processor does this with something called a microarchitectural assist. And a microarchitectural assist is basically when that pipeline is chugging along and the processor realizes something needs to happen uh, for complex operations that can't be implemented directly in silicon or in the hardware itself. Um, the processor will actually insert operations into the pipeline uh, from like a database. So it will know like if this happens, insert this microcode into the database and think of it as the processor doing something um, on the core uh, on your behalf when, when it needs to do something complex. What's interesting is since those operations have to go through load ports because they're issued on the processor itself, I can observe those values. So in this blog, that was the primary example that I used, that I showed that I can observe and watch the processor perform this page table walk uh, that is hidden. The code is not there. The, the processor, the like software, the operating system, the hypervisor, doesn't matter what level of software you are, you are not aware that these are these operations are occurring. Of course, they're documented operations, so you can deduce the fact that they might occur, and you can think about like when they would occur, but you cannot directly observe them. And that's what we've written a tool to do. So we have a tool that allows us to view and sequence. So when I say sequence, I mean that I can plot on a graph at what time these accesses occurred. Uh, more specifically, I can plot a histogram of likely, when they were most likely to have occurred, um, because we're working in a, a wild world here where we don't just get handed on a plate that these things happen. It's not like we have Wireshark. Uh, we are working with sample data with noise and traffic and cycle delays and different timing of things and different cache behaviors, different states of cache. Uh, so we we run into this noise and that's why you're looking at, at normals here and not single points or lines saying this load happened here, this load happened here, this load happened here. Instead, I'm seeing frequencies uh, showing when these loads may have occurred. So, effectively today on this stream, I want to take in some of this data and process it such that we get something a little bit easier to ingest than this data. I'm really, really happy with how this looks. Uh, however, I don't want to have to interpret this data every time I look at it. I would prefer to have software kind of look through and look for these peaks and try to look for statistical significance and try to group these and tell me this load happened here, this load happened here, this load happened here, so on and so forth, rather than showing me a bunch of these curves that as a human, I can look and kind of make sense of it and reason about it. Because if I want to do more automated things, if I want to bring up the platform that I'm standing on, you know, increase the, the height of my scaffolding, I need to make this current stuff, which is, you know, I'm at the top of the tower right now trying to like construct and, and make use of this information. But until I very concretely have processed this data, I can't build on top of this. This data is too loose, too uncontrolled for me to build on top of. And thus I want to make this data a lot more coherent and then I can build complex primitives based off of those. So that's effectively what I wanna do. 
Uh, I'm going to take a quick bio break. I'll be right back, and then we'll hop into it. See you in a second. All right, let's get that webcam back on. Yep. All right. <clears throat> Someone says boring in chat. Fine. <laughs> luckily, luckily, there are like millions of hours of content being produced out there for you. Daily. Go out there. Enjoy it. Go, go get Netflix. Go watch movies you like. Go watch streamers you like. No problem. I find this stuff entertaining. If you don't, that's fine. If you want to explain what you think is boring about it, I would love to explain why I think it's fun if there's something that you don't see in it and you would be open to to seeing something different or, or observing this in a, a different way. Um, but to me, this is really fun. And to a lot of other people, this is really fun. So we're not really here for uh, for whatever your entertainment is. Anyways... Okay, uh, so did he get all of that? Sorry, what did, what did, what did, oh, just like the explanation, the intro. Incredibly epic, even though I don't understand 99% of what's going on. You know what's awesome about this? I understand about as much about what's going on as you guys do. I have no idea what's happening. If I knew what was happening, it wouldn't be research. I have no idea. We're working with data that's unknown. We're going to be surprised. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to screw up. And that, if you don't find that fun, it's going to be really hard to do research. Give me a 30-second rundown. I missed it. Okay. I've got a CPU exploit that allows me to view uh, all traffic that goes through load ports. I'm using that exploit in a very interesting way where I use the exploit on different times and then I plot the frequency of which I see values that were present in the processor at a given time and it allows me to produce this graph where I can see where I think certain values are being loaded. So in this case I'm performing 16 loads in a row, 16 dependent loads and they're all in sequence here so the 1 through 8 uh, the like page values here and I can see that this value was loaded which was if I hover over it the 1000 the first one then this one was loaded which is the it's the 2000 and then the 3000 and then these two kind of overlap which is interesting so on and so forth actually uh, it isn't too surprising that those overlap because this is only six seconds of sampling uh, so we have a lot of noise Anyways, so we're using this exploit to view all traffic in the processor, and today our goal is to uh, make, interpret this data in a way that isn't just me looking at it as a human. So we're going to start off by, um, we've got this example here, which is what that graph was. We, we go through, we set up a linked list of 16 values, uh, then I will just wait until the, the signaling core is ready. I'll delay just a little bit, and that's just to add padding in the graph. I'll actually show you. If I don't have this delay 50, and I get rid of it. So let's show that our first data point we have here, let's say this is at like 40 on the graph. Um, 
So we have some data points down here at 40. If I get rid of that delay and build the kernel and then ship it out and run the test and collect the data, we'll see that everything will shift over uh, to the left on that time domain. So it's kind of important that we have that delay as it gives us a little bit of padding on that data such that we don't miss things that happen um, early. So here we go. Here's the new data. And here we can see we're off the chart on some of these peaks and there's probably data that we missed that is prior to this. And then at the end, uh, we'll have more spacing. This, this graph actually collects to two, 250 uh, on the x-axis. So we're not using like a lot of our, our sampling windows. So we just have that delay for that. But that's kind of showing the influence that I can have over observing these values. In fact, if I added a delay in this loop, in these 16 axes, let me just do this. Move RCX uh, 10, uh, 1. Actually, I wonder if I can do this in a repeat. I don't know if I can. Deck RCX, JNZ short, or JNZ 2B, and we'll mark that RCX gets clobbered. I don't know if that's going to build. Okay, it seems to, because uh, that's creating these labels. But since these are the temporaries, I think that actually works fine. So this is now going to put uh, 10 cycles uh, or so in between each of these loads that we perform. So let's see what this does to our data. And hopefully we'll see these peaks kind of separated apart. Um, and there we go. Yeah, they're uh, a little bit more separated than... Previously, in fact, we're missing data on the end. Uh, what's interesting is that out front, we're actually seeing some of these loads happening very close to each other. And then as time goes on, they then start to get spaced out. So I'm going to take a look at that in just a second. Just managing my tibia characters. Okay. So this is really interesting in that... Uh, uh, cam covers part of the screen. Oh, yeah, I will... Hmm. I think up here is the safest spot for the cam. Okay. Um... Uh, by the way, did you find the did you find this exploit or something you're trying to make a tool to detect when that exploit is actually exploited? Um, this is an exploit. This so this is a bug that I found in Intel processors that I reported and wrote an exploit for. Um, I don't I don't actually care about if it's exploited or not in terms of this case. Of course, uh, these bugs have all been mitigated in software and in hardware, so these shouldn't be used like for actual leaks and, and hacking any, anymore, unless you're not patched. Uh, okay. There are things I should explain that are mundane to you. I, I know. Please just uh, ask those things as they come up. That would be awesome. Um, am I getting paid to do this? If not, what motivates you to do this kind of work? I mean, this is, this is just fun to me. I, I am in this space in terms of my real work, so I kind of get paid for this. I get paid for learning things. So I get paid to learn and understand and build knowledge that I then can use to learn and understand future things. So I would say that's pretty common for hackers to be, um, that, that hackers are, are more employed for their ability to adapt and to learn and to understand things that they don't know uh, than to actually have a, a specific skill set uh, or something, uh, experience in something. It's, it's more of just being able to adapt and learn. What do, you, what do I do for work? Uh, I work at Microsoft as a security researcher. Um, okay, so that's really interesting here. Huh. Okay, that's strange. Let me, uh, I'm going to increase the windowing size of this, and then we're going to do a 60-second sample. So we're going to go to, we're going to go to 400 cycles, which should capture everything here. We're going to up this to uh, 100,000. Actually, we'll go to a million here. Uh, actually, 100,000 is fine. Um, and then here we're going to put this to 60 seconds. So this is going to take longer to collect this data, but it will uh, reduce kind of some of that noise. Um, and in fact, I want to change this from 10, a delay of 10, to a delay of 20. And to do that, I'm probably going to need to up this sample period. Let's say 800 now. 
Uh, and I do have that delay out front. Yes, I do. Okay. So this is going to take a lot longer. This is probably going to take uh, like a minute and 15 seconds to run because we're just going to collect a little bit more data such that our frequencies are, are a little bit stronger peaks and con construction. More data there. Uh, okay. So we're just waiting for this to come in. We're performing about 102,000 leaks a second. We're attempting to leak a value 2.1 million times a second. That means we're probably, uh, the time window we have is probably too large and we're missing a lot of values. Uh, we're just kind of off the charts in a lot of our sampling, uh, which is fine, not a, not a big deal. Um, we're still getting a lot of data in here. We're at 102,000 a second. It looks like we'll be have like, we'll have about 6 million uh, data points in our data, so the peaks will hopefully be a little bit stronger. Um, I've found that anything under 10 seconds seems to have the rough idea of what's going on, but it takes uh, about 60 seconds to get a really uh, really strong um, graph that has a little bit more separated peaks. So in this case, once again, what we're looking at is traversing dependent loads. So we're reading memory to get a, an address to then use for a next memory access. So this repeat, this is going to repeat this code 16 times in assembly. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a loop, but it's not because it will get unrolled. But it's going to read deref racks into racks and then delay for 20 cycles, roughly. Uh, okay, so that data is in. It's been processed, and it looks good. I don't think we missed any of the data because the highest sample was at 400, or the highest peak. Okay, so this is the data we're looking at. It looks fantastic. All right, so what I would expect to see here is that all of these peaks are separated by approximately uh, 10 cycles or so, or 20 cycles or so. Um, and I would, ex I would expect them to also be separated at a relatively uniform rate. Now, what I see is that some of these are bunched up. Uh, this is like five, this is actually probably like 15 between these two. Um, and so one thing that I don't understand yet, uh, and I have a hunch about, um, so one thing you'll notice is that these, the histograms, uh, or these curves, these like perfect normal curves, which are obviously not true to the data. The data has this shape to it. These, the, the pluses here are the actual data points, and this is an approximate normal distribution of those data points, which is not necessarily going to be correct. Um, now, these are on different axes. So these histograms are all on the same axis and normalized such that I can see these peaks. But one thing you'll see is that the blue data here uh, is up in the 7,000 range, 7,000 on the frequency. But the orange data here uh, is down here in the like 200 ballpark. And that's really weird to me. Um, although I have an explanation for it. So we're seeing... Um, Interesting. I would be curious if this data always shows up in the same way. So we should see that these will uh, flip each time. So this, this, which is the first load, has a low sample. The second load, high sample, low sample, high sample, load sample, high sample, so on and so forth. And when I see that flip-flopping in a deterministic way, I view that as I'm probably sampling only one load port. So if you look at it, you'll see that there are two different load ports here. We have load port number two, or port two, which has a, a load thing. I'm going to call it a load port, and port number three. Now, when I see something that so perfectly flip-flops between uh, wherever that data was, when I see something that flip-flops so much between this high sample, low sample, high sample, low sample, high sample, load sample, this gets me to thinking that I am not, I, I'm not sampling the two load ports evenly. That means there's something causing my code to get aligned in a certain way that it's always sampling one of the load ports. Now, that A sucks kind of for data collection, but B, 
is awesome because it means that I might have the capability here to explicitly tell you which load ports are being used. Because anywhere that this number is over a thousand, I could just set an arbitrary delimiter here of a thousand samples on the Y axis. And I can say that anything above that is on load port two. I don't know if it's two or three, but let's say it's on load port two. And anything below that happened on load port three. And that gives me one more dimension of information, a, another bit of information that I can use to learn about the processor. I can use this to learn how the processor, schedule, processor schedules loads to different ports based on their availability. And that is so fucking cool. Um, what's really interesting here is that since I have this 20 cycle delay between these load port accesses, between these loads, uh, this indicates to me that there's like a round robin, like flip flop that tells it which port to operate on. The reason I say that is because if it would always issue to two if it's free and then three if port two is not free, uh, I would expect to see the same port to be used over and over, where all of the peaks are the same if I have this 20 cycle delay, because 20 cycles is enough time for the port to cool off and be done with its access. So what I speculate is that my leak is probably only leaking one of the load ports due to the alignment of the code that it is in. The cycle that the load that my leak is in when it dispatches, um, or actually the half cycle. So since there are two loads per cycle, we're actually looking at the half cycles here. We're not looking at the like full cycles. Uh, so what I would suspect, what I want to do is I want to run this again. And I want to see if this data deterministically starts with low, high, low, high. So I'm going to make a note of that quick. So what we're seeing is low, high, low, high. And that's on the first axis is low, then it's high, then it's low and it's high. And we're going to run this like two or three times. And we're going to hope that it always is the same way. And then we're going to try to do something to the shape of our code to perform that to flip. And if we can get that to deterministically flip, then we can deterministically switch between these two and use that to get even samples between all of them. That's the goal. Yeah, so I'm either on the beginning or ending of a half cycle. That's what I'm guessing. Do we know how the load port is allocated or picked? We do not. So that's that's what's cool, is the, the fact that I see the two peaks there really strongly makes me believe that that is actually what we're observing. We're, we're truly observing these different two load ports. Um, so I could probably bring down the sampling frequency here. Uh, I don't need to run this for the entire... Um, I don't need to run this for 60 seconds uh, to learn this pattern, so this will cut down on the amount of time we're waiting for this data to get processed. So we're gonna see if this is the same pattern, and it is, and we're gonna run it again, and we're just gonna do this a couple times. I'm gonna assume that there's a, f if, if we did not control this, that there would be a 50% chance of each pattern repetition occurring, and thus, uh, what I'm looking for here is that over the course of like five runs, we never see it flip, which leads me to believe it is strictly always going to be the same pattern. Um, now, yep, there's that 1% chance that we flip the coin the right way every time, but so far, the data, so that one lined up with our prediction, and we're going to see. What if I increase the delay? So the, the delay is completely random. So the sampling that I'm doing when I'm collecting this data is actually random. I pick a random value between zero and and this sample period, the, the x-axis of our chart. I pick that random value somewhere here. Here I pick a random value to sample at and then I delay for that amount. So the, the delay is already sampling randomly, so I don't have a better way of skewing that particular delay. And this one lines up too. I'm going to do one more, and then we're going to draw some conclusions from that. So we're taking a risk here because we could have we could have rolled this dice the wrong way every time, and we could have lined up in a different way, and this could throw us off. 
But, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta s move on and try to prove things. And we're gonna see more tests when we go to test the opposite. So we're gonna try and add one more load to cause the load port, one load port to be busy uh, prior to our leak. That one, it looked like there was a flip, but there wasn't. It's still the second axis. The colors changed in our diagram, um, but the uh, but it's the same where it's the the first one is low and the second one is high. Okay. So what that means is that we want to cause that load port to be in use or busy while we perform the leak. So I'm going to do that off screen. Uh, stream term, uh, kernel. So in my banana split exploit, I'm going to put one more load out front. That's just going to be discarded. I'm just going to load into racks from RSP. Uh, and that is fine. And I'm gonna go down to this one too, and this will cause this will cause one of the load ports to be busy when we do this access. So just imagine that I'm I'm loading from negative one, and I just put another deref right before then. So I just I don't want to have the exploit on screen because I'm uh, the techniques that I use are not uh, really public yet for how I get these values out. Okay, so, waiting for that data to get processed. There we go, and <laughs> hypothesis confirmed. Let's run it again. So all I did was cause that other load port to be used. Now, I don't know which load port is actually being used, um, although I have the ability to determine that from my load port, uh, snooping my initial sushi roll research. Ah, uh, so that's fucking cool. Um, worked exactly as I expected. So that means... Yeah, it's holding up. Oh, I fucking love that! God, that's so cool. So let me put this on log scale quick. I'm gonna put uh, plot load sequence, or parse load sequence. I'm gonna put this on log scale quick. And we're gonna run this again. Technically, I don't need to rerun the whole test. I can just reprocess the data, but this is in my command line history, so I'm just using it. Uh, okay. This is fucking cool. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. That is nifty. Lines up. So now we're looking on a log scale so we can see a little bit better as to what the um, magnitudes are on these peaks. So on this peak, we're looking at about, uh, that's 90, 80, 70. So this peak is kind of at 70 cycles, or, or 700 cycles, my bad. And then down here, the second peak is looking to be about 20. So we have a difference in these peaks of, uh, let's say 700 over 20, doing my handy dandy math, it's about 35, a 35x difference in these peaks. Now, if we want to extract as much information from this data as we can, we're going to be, I know you actually can't see that peak with uh, 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 webcam, I'm sorry. See, this is why webcams kind of suck with sciencey things, you don't have a great place to put them. But anyways, we have this peak at about 700 and this peak at about uh, 20 or whatever. So we have about a 30x difference in these peaks. Now that means that it's going to be very difficult for us to write a general purpose algorithm that will kind of sample and sh show these peaks and process these in a better way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write uh, two variants of my exploit, one which has a delay of one load and one which does not, and then I'm going to switch between them. I'm going to have a 50% chance of using one and a 50% chance of using another, and then that will allow me to hopefully have all of the peaks be relatively consistent in their uh, frequencies, because we see that for the tall peaks are all about the same and the low peaks are all about the same. So if I switch between these, 50% of the time, I would expect that all the peaks are now even, and then I don't have to normalize the peaks. Because if I had to normalize the data, uh, 
I would potentially be amplifying things that aren't necessarily strong signals. I would like for the y-axis of this to be true signal rather than some amplified, modified, normalized signal because I, I want to see that if there is a small peak here, if there was a small peak, that it truly is a small peak and it isn't just, um, it isn't just due to it getting compressed or, or, or something. So, I'm going to go, uh, I, I think I have to make multiple copies of my exploit. I'm not quite sure what the best way for me to do this is. So, I have an M fence in my exploit, which will cause all of the um, loads to expire. So, I can bring... Uh, the problem is, I don't think I can have a loop where I can have a programmatic... Uh, like access, so I need to have some way. I think I'm just gonna make two copies of my leak codes, um, and I think yeah, that's probably gonna be the easiest way. It's weird because it's a lot of code duplication, but I think it's the best way that I can do it right now because that will cause a separate. Uh, so this is gonna be a leak binary uh, next port. We're gonna call that. And then that looks good. Leak any next port. I know I'm off screen on this. And that's intentional. And we're going to scroll down to here. And that looks good. So those are going to have a one delay load. And then these are not. Um, and I don't know if there's a good way in Rust to coerce templates into... Uh, inline assembly, so I'm not quite sure if there's a great way for me to do that. Uh, am I going to upload my pay-per-view to YouTube? Uh, it scrolled off of Twitch. I do have that VOD. My plan was to edit that down and to, like, give kind of, like, a more edited video on that because it was very long and very rambly. Um, but I might just give in and upload it if, if I'm just going to be too lazy to get to that. Video editing is very slow for me right now because I still... I just don't know how to do it well enough yet. I don't have the, like, speed down. Okay. So, I have two different versions of this exploit now. I have something called leak any, and I have something called leak any underscore next port. So what I want to do is I want to have a 50% chance of picking them. So we'll do let leaked is equal to... Um, B split dot rand and one. If this, if this value is equal to zero, otherwise this. And in this case, we're going to have this version of the leak. And in this case, we're going to have next ports. And then this will be leaked. Now, this is the leak any variant, and I also need to do this on the leak binary variant. So we'll do, um, ooh, I need to do, yep, delay, okay. And then down here, I have to do the same thing. It's going to be the exact same code, basically, kind of, sort of, very similar. That I now scrolled off screen because I hit page up on accident. Okay. So we're going to set that delay. I'm going to then perform a leak binary. If leak binary, uh, target val, same thing down here. I've got some missing parentheses. Leak binary, next port, and leaked. If leaked, then we update that frequency. Okay, if that and one, this one, put the parens, leak any next port, leak binary, uh, and that, oh, I probably should put an if. If I'm doing an if statement, I should, probably should put an if keyword in there. The little things in life. Okay, I think that's good. All right, so now we're going to see if these peaks are going to be at the same Heights. Who knows? Why isn't my YouTube in my description? I don't know. I don't know. I probably should have it in there. My YouTube can be found at youtube.com slash gamozolabs. 
Let me just get that link for you guys. Here we go. Okay. What do you guys think? What do you guys think? Is this data going to be good? Actually, from up here, I'm questioning it. Because this has the same... Ah, please be good. Beautiful. Exactly what I wanted to see. Look at that shit. Wow. Really happy with that. Really happy with that. Okay. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. And that's with log scale. Let's turn off log scale and uh, let's see what we get. We're going to turn off log scale. We're going to increase our sampling time to 60 seconds. We're going to run a little bit longer test while I use the restroom again. I've been chugging water. Be right back. Data, data, data. There we go. Okay, I think I missed something. If we are randomly picking one or another method, why are we seeing all peak at the same level? Uh, also, a random question. Are you using arrows or HJKL on Vim? I use the arrow keys in Vim. I think they're just, they're just better. I realize it's not as old school, but they're just better. All right, let's see what the data is. Yeah, those look good. Those look really good. So it still looks like the peaks are slightly different. We've got peaks around 4,000 and peaks around 3,000, but that is a 25% difference, or actually a 33% difference, uh, compared to a 35x difference. So it's a, uh, yeah, I'm happy with that. Um, now I'm now I'm much more comfortable drawing conclusions uh, with this data. Wow, that is so cool. I noticed that very early on. So, we still have we still have our 20 cycle delay in here. Now, one thing that I noticed is that the peaks here um are definitely closer than 20 cycles. It's like these are almost on top of each other. Now, you could maybe say um, okay, so uh, here, here's my theory. So these, uh, whatever ports these are lining up on, or whatever this is, these look very square. The tops of these uh, samples look very square. And these ones, the, the others, the, so let's say this is the even one and this is the odd one. The even ones look to have very square and protruding tops, and the low ones seem to have very sharp tops. Now, something that you can kind of use on like processor sampling is the earliest value observed. So right now we're looking at kind of averages and means based on the, the normal distributions here. However, um, that can be skewed by delays and, and latencies and, and different things. However, the earliest something happens in the processor cannot change. So if you want to, for example, if you want to time how long a cache access takes, 
the longest time of a memory access is basically unbounded. You could have a context switch and another process spin up and millions of cycles elapse in that load. Um, but the shortest amount of time that can happen uh, is is physically limited to some speed. It's the fastest that that can propagate through the silicon and the load can be performed. That will isolate out all of the noise and delays and, and latencies and weird timing things because the fastest something can happen is you can't beat that. <laughs> so one way that we could potentially go about filtering this data is we could go with the earliest we observed a data point for a certain value. And if we go by the earliest observed value, we know that it's it's not possible that something that happened, I mean, since we're randomly sampling, like everything is possible, uh, but let's take a look down here. So we've got, um, well, we're gonna zoom in on uh, this sample here. We're gonna go from zero to 200. We're gonna look at just the first couple peaks here uh, and let's take a look. So we'll go into this. We'll modify this to set an X range of zero to 200. And then we're gonna go into log scale here because I wanna see some of the really low uh, frequency points. And we're just gonna run this separately so we process this data and we don't have to rerun the test. Okay, so now we have a new graph. Uh, it's a lot more spread out because we've kind of elongated this axis, but, or axes. So, um, the distance between these two peaks here. So we've got, um, this is the first load and this is the second load. This is going by the mean frequency weighted distributions. Uh, that would be the omega of the function right, for the fastest time possible? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, is, is that omega for statistics? I would need to read up on that. I, I have no math background, so I don't, I will probably struggle with a lot of terminology here. <laughs> um, okay, so these are separated by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine cycles. So I'm gonna make a quick note of that and I'll do this. We'll put the notes over here. Uh, whoops, okay. I'll just do this, and I'm gonna say uh, distance of means nine cycles. So they're nine cycles apart for these two means. Uh, right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yep, nine and some change. Who cares about the change? So the distance between those two means is nine cycles, but let's take a look at the distance between the first occurrences. And this is one, the first occurrence of this versus the first occurrence of this. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think there's another in there. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So the distance of the first occurrences we saw was 14. Um, so now it's hard to say when you're dealing with things in the ones, these, this is everything under this line, this is the 10 line and log scale. So these are very low amounts of samples. I could maybe go by the first, uh, first point over like 100 so let's look at the first point over a hundred here, and I might need, I might need to switch into a version uh, that's not SVG based, so I can take a look in uh, and hover over some of these points. So let's look at parse load seek dot pi, and I'm gonna switch this to uh, set term x, and we're gonna do size uh, one thousand by. Actually, we're gonna do uh, 1500 by 900. And we do have this, we'll put this in persistent mode so it will stay alive. And hopefully this will pop up. Uh, I think it's just a capital X on that. This will then pop up an interactive window, okay. And since I have tiling on, it didn't like that, so we'll rerun it, there we go. So now we have a little bit more interactive data. I don't know. Uh, I can't really zoom, but in the bottom left corner, I have the, um, I can see where the cursor is on the X and Y scales. So the Y scale doesn't work in log scale, but that's fine. So we're gonna say the first point, the first blue point 
over 100 was at 60, 61 cycles. And the first green point over 100 was at 81. That is exactly 20. That is, like, that is what we want, right? We have, we have this one at 61. If I'm hovering over it, I definitely am. And then this one is at 81. And that, I'm looking at this, uh, this corner here. Um, to see these. I, I know that's not really going to be visible. Um, just installed Rust up the other night. Can't wait to jump in. Oh my god, Rust is so fun. What are we looking at? What's the metrics? What do you mean by that? What um, What is the data we're looking at or what is the like, uh, wh how are we constructing this graph or what What are the What are the things here? So I'll, I'll, I'll go through both actually because there are people here who probably are new. So the data we're looking at here are loads that are occurring on the Intel processor that were leaking using a CPU exploit to see hidden loads that are happening on the processor. In this case, these aren't hidden, but whatever. Uh, the, what we're seeing is on the x-axis, we're seeing the time, the execution time of the processor in cycles. So it's kind of like the, it's like the quantum, uh, or not the quantum, the... Um, it's like the Planck distance on the x-axis. It's like the smallest timing interval that we can get access to in the processor. Um, I think there, I might have some techniques to go sub-cycle on those, but uh, that's another research thing. On the y-axis, we have the frequency that we've observed a given value. So the different colors are the different values that we've observed labeled in this key. And so we're seeing the frequency of which. So at, let's say this is uh, at... 90 cycles in time. So on the 90th cycle, when we delayed for 90 cycles and took a sample, we saw this value this many times. So we saw this value about 3,000 times. And at cycle number, whatever this is, 97, 98, uh, we saw this green value, this 2,000, this elite 2,000 value about 2,000 times. And we're seeing kind of these frequency distributions because the processor has noise. This, this x-axis, I can't pin to a very pre precise time domain. So instead, what I'm doing is I'm just fine with the noise, and I'm going to hope that these are going to have kind of common peaks and shapes to them. Um, so what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to take this data, which is very noisy and hard to interpret and kind of requires a human thinking about what might be happening to con make conclusions. Uh, and I'm trying to make this more discreet. And and the, the goal is to kind of sharpen up some of these things. Clock cycle time, right? Yep. So that is effectively what we're looking at. So we're using a, a CPU vulnerability to look at hidden loads in the processor. We're sequencing them. And due to the fact that everything we're doing here is completely undefined behavior, um, it's all very sciency, and we're looking at fuzzy data, and we're trying to make that fuzzy data less fuzzy so we can draw conclusions from it. Um, now, I can draw conclusions from this data personally. Uh, this is clear enough for me to interpret. It's, it's pretty quick to go through and look at these peaks and these axes, but I'd like to have more confidence in this data, and I would like for, uh, to take a statistical approach to uh, this data rather than a visual approach to this data. Okay, so uh, as I was saying that these, these two peaks, uh, we know that they should be about 20 cycles apart. Now there's going to be differences in those loops depending on the like, um, depending on the uh, prediction of those branches, whether it should continue in that loop, there's a comparison, but we've estimated that the, it's about one cycle for those delays. So I'm going to up the delay and let me see how many how big my margins are here. It looks like my margins, uh, I could go up to about, let's push this up to, we've got that starting 50 cycle delay, and then we've got a 20 cycle delay between peaks. We've got, uh, I'm going to push that out to about 150 cycles. So I'm going to try to put, I'm going to put like a 100 cycle delay on that. So we're going to go from a 20 cycle delay to a 100 cycle delay. We're going to zoom in a little bit more on the data. We're going to sample only up to, uh, we'll sample up to 250. And then we'll go into parse load sequence and we'll make this go to 0 to 250. 
and this will be observing all of our data. There's gonna be things kind of off the screen that we're not gonna to get to see, but that's fine. This is going to really focus in on the area that we're interested in and, and we'll collect a little bit more data because we've narrowed that sample window. As you can see, we're actually only sampling the first three values here. Uh, looking at the sampling done, uh, it looks like we're catching a lot of 1,000, a lot of 2,000, and barely catching 3,000s. Are you collecting data using Rust and then plotting with Python? So technically, all of this uh, data collection is done in my custom operating system. So this this code that you see me writing, this is an operating system. This is a this is code that I run and I build into a kernel. And then every time you see me generating this data, I'm actually rebooting that server and causing it to uh, restart and run with this new kernel and process this data. The reason for that is I need a much lower noise environment to sample this information than a traditional operating system. So this is actually kernel level um, custom code. That's why you see uh, use of core here instead of the standard library as I don't have access to that. So this is a uh, very low level stuff. Like here I'm enabling being able to use AVX on the processor and, and setting up interrupts and um, it's very much so a, a kernel. Okay, so this is actually really interesting and I don't know how to interpret this data. Um, wow, that is really strange. Um, um, something doesn't seem right here and I'm trying to figure out if, if I'm correct in that. I don't know why I'm seeing these accesses happen prior to sampling. I don't know why we're seeing this access persist throughout. Now it's possible, it's possible, this whole time we're doing this, it's possible that a value can survive in that load port and we can leak the same value for a longer time. Um, it's possible that the, the size of this delay causes this, uh, we might be observing what I hypothesized earlier that we're only viewing one of the load ports and what we might be seeing is that, oh my God, that's really cool. I, I actually have to uh, widen this window. I think I know what's going on here. Okay. Oh yeah, I've been, I've been doing OS dev for a while. So um, I do it for fun. I do it for fun, and then I find stupid shit like this that allows me to justify doing it. <laughs> That's my life. That's my life in a nutshell. I do really stupid things, like writing o OSs, and then I find uses to having that much control over a system, uh, and, I, and I almost always get rewarded for it. I did that for my fuzzing, like my hacking research, I wrote a custom OS and hypervisor to use for fuzzing and harnessing applications and observing what they're doing and, and finding crashes. And sure enough, it outperforms every fuzzer by such a large margin that it's it's just it's just silly. Like I can get 5,000 fuzz cases a second on something like Word that other people struggle to get five fuzz cases every 10 seconds. Um, and I have code coverage on things that I don't have source to and, and a bunch of things. And I've been doing that for like four or five years. I've I only recently, like last year, started to talk more about kind of the work that I've done there. Uh, but a lot of that was I just wanted to write an OS. Like I wrote the first hypervisor because I was interested in it. And I, and I, have, I have this secret to development. Um, okay, I need to change the axis on this. Um, I have this secret to development and it's that while what I do probably takes a lot more time to accomplish, uh, the, oh my God, this data is beautiful, and I know exactly what's going on here. Oh, it's so cool. Uh, we'll come back to this in a second. So programming is really interesting in that we can all lie to ourselves and to management and all these people about that we're effective when we're doing things we don't like, uh, but in reality, that's just not true. In reality, when we're working on things that we don't enjoy, uh, we browse more Reddit and watch more YouTube and do shit that we waste time more on. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, like, I think that's totally fine. You know, if I walk by a coworker and they have fucking YouTube up all day, I don't really, 
I don't really give them shit for it because it's it's probably just they have shitty tasking and it's an off day and it's boring. Um, now I recognize that having a good worth ethic ethic is important and being able to do things that you don't like is important. But here's some perspective. I probably can write an operating system that can do basically anything that I want to do for a specific research task. I'm not talking about rewriting Linux or general purpose thing that other people can use. But in terms of me writing an operating system for something that I want to do, it takes me like a weekend. I've got a bunch of kernels already around that I can scavenge from and I can build a new operating system with the properties that I need. Um, and yeah, if I, I might be able to collect the same data or do the same thing in one day, in theory, on Linux or Windows or something else. But if I am not as interested in doing that, it'll take me a weekend to write that operating system because I want to and I'm interested and I'm passionate. But it would take me a month to do that one day of work of getting it working on Linux because that because I'm working in an environment that I don't enjoy or want to work in. So I try to make all of my problems into things that I enjoy more, and I try to spin them into things that just make them more interesting. Um, and a lot of times, that's bringing in an operating system. I love low-level dev. That being said, I, th I think there's, there's a level of control that you get that allows you to do things that are really innovative in an operating system context. Um, like my memory manager and my kernel can rewind and reset VMs like 250,000 times a second. But you can't do that in Hyper-V. Hyper-V, it takes fucking two seconds to reset a VM. Zen, it takes like a second to reset a VM. And having control and direct access to hardware allows you to implement algorithms using just different constructs than the operating systems provide to you. I know you can write drivers to do a lot of those things, but when you're working with drivers and you're working in someone else's environment, uh, you end up having to conform to what they require. So for example, in my operating system, I can just change the timing of the like interrupts that I get, the like task switch style interrupts. I've used those to collect code coverage to randomly sample and break into a VM and, and get the the instruction it's executing. Now I can do that uh, in my operating system. I can just say, hey, I want a pit timer interrupt or an APIC timer interrupt a million times a second. I don't give a shit. And I know I can do that because I know the ramifications to that are none because I understand the system and the system is so simplified because it's not a general purpose system. You can't do that on Linux. You can't, you can't use interrupts to sample code on Linux. You can, of course, maybe slightly tweak those timer values, but if you were to set the timers on Linux that run at like a thousand hertz and set them to a megahertz, I can guarantee you nothing's going to work. Interrupts are going to like double up and stack up on interrupt, uh, on interrupt windows and you're going to get like nested interrupts. You're going to have issues where things can't run for long enough that things don't work. But when you're in an environment you control, it's you can just do those things. And, and that's what I consider operating system development. I don't write, I don't write Linux clones. I don't write Unix things. I don't write, I, honestly, most of my operating systems don't even take input. They literally only give out input. Maybe they'll take in like a, an input or a, a, like a snapshot or, or a VM image from over the network and then operate on it. But the reason it takes me, um, the reason it takes me 120 milliseconds to boot my kernel and reboot, even though that server takes like 60 seconds to reboot, is because I made very careful attention to make sure that I can replace my kernel in memory. So I'm able to go through and I can simply download a new kernel, that's what I'm doing when this progress bar is running, um, and then replace the kernel and just run the new one. And I call this a soft reboot. Uh, Linux has a similar thing, I think it's called kexec, um, I don't know, it's a little flaky, but I need my dev cycle to be really short because since my operating system doesn't take input, it doesn't give me a terminal or anything I can type into or 
there's no human interaction at all. My human interaction is telling it what to do. And telling it what to do is coding it. And coding it, I need this tight dead loop because or this tight dev loop because if I have no way to dynamically change what it does, I need to be damn well sure that I can make code changes, build it, and ship and run it in under about 10 seconds. If it's over that, I just you lose focus if if your dev cycle is too wide. Um, so that's that's why I love doing kernel dev. I I'm literally taking down all cores on the system, resetting them, sending them init signals to actually reset those cores, um, and I'm doing that in 120 milliseconds. And in fact, a lot of that is due to the fact that I have to time the I have to uh, sample to figure out the frequency of the um, of the TSC. And that will be in calibrate here. So in calibrate, I'm sampling for this, which is about 54 milliseconds. So for, for about 55 milliseconds, so about half of my boot time, is waiting to sample to see how fast this RDTSC runs at. Uh, now, I consider pretty much anything under half a second to not matter because it's imperceptible. Uh, so I keep that number high. I could cut that down, but then I'd lose accuracy on my, my like calibration of that timer. Anyways, that's my long ass tangent. Uh, let me check up on tax, uh, things. Uh, okay. Numfin, did that kind of answer your questions? Wake me up when you finished. Yep. That's my rant. Any resources you recommend to people wanting to write operating systems in Rust? Um... I'm not aware of, like, actually there are a couple, I think, blogs going through, like, writing operating systems in Rust. Uh, I think the best way to write operating systems is to understand what your code is shaped like when it gets compiled and then figuring out how the processor handles arbitrary code. Because once you have those two things, you can write an OS in any language. Um, you, you have to figure out what your runtime requirements are. You have to figure out if you need to have like a VM stack, if it's Java or Python or whatever. Uh, but I think understanding it, I, I recognize that's a really terrible, a really terrible advice for getting into it. But I would say like, get get comfortable with assembly. Play around with compiling things and seeing what code gets emit. Um, don't read the Intel manual, but skim the Intel manual. Like just read the like section headers and 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 kind of understand roughly what the processor requires. This is for Intel OS Dev. Like OS Dev on ARM uh, gets a lot easier because they're much simpler processors. Uh, ARM 64 is not necessarily in that category anymore. It's much more similar to XD6. But yeah, um, yeah, I should do an OS Dev tutorial. I think that would be really fun. Uh, I don't jive the best with the OS dev community because, um, you know, the meme where people go on to stack overflow and they ask a question about how to do something and everyone just says, why are you doing it that way? Uh, well, OS dev is very similar to that. When I go in and I'm talking with other OS devers who I respect, um, and I'm talking about my kernels, or we're discussing things, and basically their conclusion every time is your kernels are fucking trash. Because their goal, their goal in OS dev is to make a kernel that takes user input and provides a GUI and has task switches and management of things and user and kernel land isolation. And they're, they're trying to make Linux or Windows or Unix or who cares? Um... And sometimes it's very difficult for me to like, that, that's what I'm kind of concerned with if I give like an OS dev course that people are gonna be like, this is not operating systems development uh, because it's much different than that. It's more of low level processor development. I, I would say, I wouldn't say that this is an operating system. I, I say that because it takes two words to describe roughly what I'm doing here. Uh, but I wouldn't consider it an operating system until you're you're building, you know, at least threads and scheduling and and user and, and kernel land isolation. But yeah, Guyville Coldwin had uh, an OSTF series. Yeah, I saw that. I never actually watched it, but I did see he was doing that, and that was really cool. I think he I think he did that in Polish though, right? Um, 
Anyways, that's that was a long tangent, but it's really important to be passionate and into what you do if you want to be really effective. So, oh my god, these graphs are beautiful because I think I understand what is going on in these graphs. Now, first of all, this graph is really interesting. Uh, uh, this orange plot here. Um, let me make sure you guys can see that. This orange plot is bizarre. It's like two separate normals with a very sharp thing here. Uh, I like that, that's cool. We've got this one, looks like a baby bottle here. I'm gonna call that the baby bottle curve where it's like a normal on top of a normal and then flattened out. So, here's my hypothesis. There are two load ports on the Intel processor, and I'm not sure necessarily how my leak works, but let's say that it leaks the most recent loaded value on that load port. So let's say at any given time, two values can be leaked. Now what that means is that you can have two values, this blue value, and this green value, if this is green, I'm colorblind, uh, this X value here, my theory would be that you can have two values being sampled at a given time. So when I break in, so at, uh, let's say I'm right here, I'm at 186 cycles, my timer just timed up, I'm going to say sample a, a load port, and then I do. And I sample that load port, and here's what I see. I see, um, I see like basically a 50-50 split between this first value and the second value. Now, what that would make me think is that each of those values are being held in their respective load ports. And the reason I'm seeing two of them is because I'm randomly choosing between which load port I want to sample, and thus, here are the two values. Now, what do we see when a third value comes online, when this blue value comes online? The more this value comes online, the more these decrease, and this one starts to decrease here as well. And by the point that there, this third value comes fully online, this blue value almost goes fully offline. And I think that is exactly what we are seeing here. And then we see that this new, this light blue, uh, becomes kind of the replacement for this, uh, this load board. So I would guess what we're seeing here is this blue value is in load port A, and then it's replaced by this value in the same load port and this is what we're seeing on the other load ports. Now, I'm not quite sure why we're seeing this curve. That's very strange to me, and that could be a figment of the way we sample. But these very squarish uh, distributions here are really interesting to me on these, because this looks like this is surviving basically until that point. So I'm gonna zoom out once again. Um, wow, that is gorgeous. That is really cool. I'm gonna zoom out. We're gonna go to uh, 1200 on our sample period. Hopefully this will get us a couple more uh, rotations of that. And we're gonna see if that lines up uh, and continues to hold as a theory. And that is not the new data. Here we go. It's purple, not blue. Yep, there we go. There's the color blindness. <laughs> Heli's not a problem, yeah. I didn't know you knew Polish disconnected. Did you learn it as a second language or did you learn English as a second language? I guess I don't I don't actually know who you are. Maybe you've told me we've met RL. Fuck. God damn it, I'm an asshole. Um Shit, I am so bad with names. It's nothing against you. <laughs> I'm just bad with names. Remind me again. Give me a give me a good kick next time we meet up. <laughs> I was playing my twink. Oh shit. Oh. Up in recon, chilling up in the in the party. I actually haven't played on that server in a while. I, I retired from my guild there. Cause it was just kind of starting to turn into too much work. All right, here comes the data. What are we gonna get? What are we gonna get? It's gonna be good. You gonna go to recon and uh, 
recon this year or infiltrate this year? I'm going to go to infiltrate and recon for sure. Those are always two in my rotation. What kind of work do you think rust devs are typically conditioned for or commissioned for? I have no... Oh, that's gorgeous. I have no idea. Holy shit. This is what I wanted to see. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. So we have a couple... What's interesting here is that the shapes follow such common thing. We have these, like, square tops on these ports. Uh, we kind of get these, like, little little fins here. This looks actually... This looks very similar to a capacitor charge discharge uh, diagram. Um, and then we have these other ones. Now, this one... I'm going to ignore the first two because I'm going to... I'm going to say that everything in the start of this data is the processor is warming up. So it's not quite gotten in its groove yet. So these data things, these are going to look a little different than everything else. But I would suspect that everything else will look very similar. And that's what we see. We see that this is very square. It starts to get a little bit more rounded off. And then it turns into this like logarithmic growth or, uh, uh, or like square root growth here. And then that goes into this next one, which looks similar. And this one we kind of don't get to see. Um, and then if we look at the secondary, the odd ones, we see that this peak is very sharp with kind of a, a stop here. We see that this one goes up and it bounces a couple times. This one goes up and it bounces a couple times, bounces a couple times, bounces a couple times. And when I see repetition like this in data, that leads me to believe that I can do um, like convolutions of these things. Uh, if you're not familiar with convolutions, and I am not a math or sciencey person, but uh, let's bring up Wikipedia because Wikipedia is great for getting confused about things because they word them in ways that sound so cool uh, but aren't helpful. So convolutions are basically... Um, Let's see what Wikipedia says. Uh, is a mathematical operation on two functions, f and g, that produces a third function by expressing how the shape of one is modified by the other. Yeah, that's fucking useless. All right. So the graph is better. The graph shows kind of what we're looking at. Take two graphs. Like... Overlay them, like in this case, F and G, multiply them together, and you get this product, this F multiply G. And now you see, like, the two aspects of these get multiplied together, and you get this shape and, and whatever. Um, now, this convolution here, or this F star G, uh, F, this one, this... This graph is, is the convolution graph, and the way that a convolution works is by sliding these two things. So you basically take two different things, you multiply them together, and then you slide them by each other while multiplying them. And then that is this final function, this, this resulted thing. And you can see that, like, how do you have a data point that is positive here, that's non-zero, prior to any data existing? And that's because this G wave has been slid across, and that's what this is showing here. So at the start, F and G are over, like barely overlapping, and then they're sliding this red, this G function, this like triangle shark fin shape over this and multiplying it and going through. And they're, they're um, if I'm not mistaken, they're, they're multiplying the entirety, they're getting the integral of it, so they're, they're getting the area under the curve, and then they're plotting that here. So... Uh, I think is what they're doing. So when F and G are not overlapped at all, everything multiplies down to zero, and thus the data point you get is zero, and then as they slide more and more and overlap more and more, you get to see this. Now, why is this useful at all to us? And this allows us to potentially find uh, where these graphs overlap the most. So when I'm talking about these have similar shapes, uh, convolutions is one way to put that into actual meaning and, and scientific terms. So right now I'm just saying these look like they have similar shapes, which is easy for a human to say. But what I want to do is perform a convolution. For example, I want to take these circle points, these circles with a dot, and take these triangle points because they have similar shapes. They have this like shoot, bounce, bounce, bounce. 
And what I want to do is take those two, isolate them out, slide them across each other, and then find where they overlap the most and then plot them on top of each other so I can see. Um, so then I can see which ones are, uh, like, where they line up the most, where the most overlap is. Does that make any sense? I don't think the mathy stuff is easier to understand, but I don't... I don't understand what the cross correlation is here. Is that just a different way of, uh, oh. So convolution, that gets flipped. Cross correlation, it seems like it does not. So they flip G, apparently, according to these diagrams. Uh, F star G. I don't, I don't know the difference between these necessarily, but I don't really care. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to basically construct this. We're going to slide them across each other, multiply all the points in the curve. We're going to then sum those values up, and then we're going to plot that as a data point for that location of the slide. <sighs> all right. That's what we're going to do. So first, we have to isolate out two pieces of data that we're interested in. I'm interested in this blue teal circle, which is 6,000, and the black triangle, which is 8,000. So I'm going to take the 8,000 data and the 6,000 data, and we're going to put those in a nice location. Uh, cargo new bin uh, convol convolutions. And we're going to copy this data into convolutions, and we're going to copy this data into convolutions. Data.txt. Okay. And then we're going to shift that over here, and we're going to get into this. Let's make sure we understand what the data are, what the format our data is in. It looks like X frequency, uh, X in cycles, and then the frequency. Uh, looks good, kind of went up, went down, looks great, and let's take a look at the 8,000, and this should just have a different peak at a different location, fantastic, so it's just like space, white space separated lists, so we're going to write a parser for these formats, and we're going to do all of this code, I know there are many, many, many tools out there that can do this for us, but once again, what I'm not what I'm interested in is implementing these things, figuring out how they work and how they behave, and learning from that, right? If I were to go and find some Python MATLAB-y thing that would just do this for me, I wouldn't really understand the ramifications of some of the transforms that I'm performing. So I want to, I want to implement them myself so I can see what does and doesn't work at a very low level such that I can pick and choose those later in my life. It, it's very similar to what I do with OS Dev and other research I do. Um, if you understand how things work, it's typically a lot better than understanding what to use that kind of works. You, you like, I like in my IL, for example, my my IL and my kind of it's effectively a compiler. My JIT, um, in my JIT, I could totally just use a third-party JIT. There are so many JITs out there, but I want to go through and implement these things. And, and then sure enough, the JIT that I wrote outperforms those in many different ways. Now it underperforms them in many ways as well, uh, but the areas that I cared about that I wanted to put the attention on, they perform really well in. And it's important to understand that while you might mathematically or like fundamentally at a high level be attempting to do the same thing, under the hood, there are many optimizations. You can optimize you can optimize your lifting of assembly. You can optimize your generation of code. You can optimize your assembler. You can optimize your reordering. You can optimize your optimization passes. And it's what matters is at the end of the day, if you use a third-party tool, you don't get to decide which parts got polished. You just get what you get. Where at the end of the day, you might want to have, maybe you don't care about the code gen side of things. You don't care if it takes a day to generate the code, but you care about really good optimization passes. And you get to have that control when you write your own tools. Okay. Stream term. So, here we're gonna have our code that will run. Give that a little bit more space, and then we'll go into sushi roll, CPU graphing, convolutions. 
this will be our code here, and we're gonna write a, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do this clean. We'll do like, um, um, white, white space parser. Not a great name, but uh, parses white space separated um, columnated uh, columns columns in new line separated text files. Uh, and let's see, we might have to make this specific to, all right, we don't have to know anything about hex. Uh, all numbers should be in decimal. Uh, prefixes will be ignored. And this will be data vec, vec i64. So outer vector is the are the rows, inner vectors are the columns. I don't want to imagine what the RDRAND graph looks like. It is really hard to sample, because um, I do have to use the values to line them up uh, to have like association. And RDRAND, that load that is dispatched is random, so I actually can't, I can't associate that with anything on the graph because it's different every time I sample. It, it's kind of... Uh, I don't know if I, I, I wouldn't use the same approach that I'm using now to look at something that's random or non-deterministic. Imple white space parser, white space parser, pub fn load, we'll make this public as well, might as well, uh, load. This is going to take a p as ref path, and path p white space parser k use standard path path and then this is going to let contents is equal to uh, standard fs read to string path this will take an io result Use standard IO result. Actually, use standard IO. I like to separate uh, and not overlap with the built in result, the default one. Okay, and that will return a white space. That name is really hard to type out. A white space parser with data, and this is, we'll just call this data. Uh, let mute data is equal to vec new. Okay, read the entire file into memory. Parse a white space delimited column. Parse a white space delimited columns with new line separated row text file. Separated. Okay. Uh, as decimal values. Okay. We got the data that we parsed out of the file for line in contents.lines, print line. This is about the time that I want to test to actually make sure that this code is roughly doing what I want. So we'll do data is equal to white space parser load of this file name. This can return an IO result as well. Okay, cargo run. Looks great. Okay, so now what we can do is split these. Um, and the problem is I need to deal with arbitrary sized white space. I want to uh, I want to compress down that white space and kind of get rid of the the multiple spaces there. Um, so I can do replacement, or I can like actually parse it by reading and then stopping. So I could, hmm, what's the best way here? I can just consume, I can write an iterator over the line and just consume things, but then I'd have to accumulate those in a dynamically sized thing. Uh, 
I could... Trying to think, trying to think. I, perf doesn't really matter in this case, uh, but it might matter in future cases when I have more data. So it's important that I do this in a relatively efficient way because I don't want this to be the bottleneck of the processing. I want the processing to be mathematical and not on some floofy, who cares, uh, parsing stuff. So I'm gonna see, I can split these. So I can do... Uh, Split white space, Does, I, that just already exists then. I don't know if that's gonna split on every occurrence of white space or if that's gonna deal with, um, uh, and then we'll just do like dot collect. Can I say this? Can I do this? Can I turbo, or turbo fish that one? Uh, this. And that. Okay, perfect. There we go. Well, so this isn't as fast as it could possibly be because I'm performing an allocation when I'm doing the collection of these. Um, although I'm going to need to do that anyway. So before we do a collect, I'm going to do uh, we're going to do dot map x x dot parse. And then that will go into whatever format we want. And then we'll collect that into a vector of i64s. Dot expect invalid decimal number. And we'll just clean this up a little bit. So that's going to go through each thing split by white space. It's going to then parse that into an i64. And we're going to put that in, the, in this line. We'll do, that'll collect into that, and then we'll do uh, data, just data.push this. Okay, and then we just screwed one of those up. I'm just gonna delete a random one, hope that worked, looks good. And now I should be able to pretty print this, and this should be the, our data, yeah. They're all our records, and they're all separated, and they're all parsed into ints. Okay, looks good. So we've got, um, now we're gonna do a, uh, let's see. I'm trying to think if I wanna use floating point values or if I want to do integer values. So the downside of using floating point values is you start running into some, uh, you start running into weird behaviors and clipping and values aren't as even as they can be. So I think I might keep the data as integers or fixed point and then do fixed point math on it such that I don't lose anything due to rounding. Um, so we're going to stick with I64s instead of floats. Uh, okay. Convolution. So we're going to do a convolution between two sets of data. And uh, I guess we'll want to pad the data with zeros. Um, trying to think how I want to do this. Uh, we'll call this set A. This is going to be a, a reference of vectors of I64. And then this will be a B, which is a reference of, or a slice of vectors of I64s. And I just can't really coerce the inner vector. I don't know of a good way in Rust to do this. So my data is in this format, but I want it to be looking like that. I Maybe I can somehow get the inside to be... No, I think... I don't think I can do that without making a, a separate copy. So I think I have to keep it this way. I could template it and have it where, uh, um, I'm going to try that. I'm going to try and do that just because I don't do this as much as I should. I'm going to do as ref. So we're going to say T can be obtained as a reference of that. And then the outside slice is fine. So we have a slice with inside slices, and then hopefully Russ can figure out that we can put in a convolution. We'll do, uh, let's do A, B, and then here we'll do convolution of ref A dot data, ref B dot data, and let's see, vec 
T doesn't implement as ref that. Is that true? I mean, obviously it's true. Uh, Rust as ref slice. Maybe it's dref? No, I don't think so. No, it's, um, see what vec implements. Yeah, as ref t for vec t. Oh, I need to do an into, don't I? Uh, where my code is, dot into here. Dot into. What OS is this? In terms of what OS are we collecting the data on? Or what is the, hmm. Oh, maybe it needs to be deref. Let's see what vec implements here. Might need to be deref to get that. Maybe it's, maybe it's not prop possible to express what I want. Uh, methods for deref. Uh, Rust. So this operating system is Linux as my host, and then the, the operating system I'm using uh, for collecting the data is called sushi roll. It's a custom kernel that I wrote. Okay, so impl t deref, yeah, 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 yep, yep, yep. I don't know. Is there a good way for me to do this? Um, I'm trying to think of something in, if it takes a slice of slices, is there a way that I can genericize the inner slices? Uh, I don't think into. Did we borrow? Borrow for t. Vec t. Wait, what are these? Trait implementations. This is for vec. As ref that. That's kind of what we want. Borrow that for vec. From box. I really only care about things that can can create this. I could do f f as mute, borrow mute. Can I do? I don't think borrow. Because what was it complaining about? It's saying that if we go into these. Um, trait cannot be satisfied. Vec t as ref t. Oh, whoa. Uh, that. Yeah, I totally had it. Sorry, I I had the generic in there. So yeah, this will take. A slice of any, and in, in fact, I could make that like completely generic and just do, uh, can I do this? And then have these take T's? I don't know if I can do that. Uh, yeah, as ref, uh, those have to be references. Does that work? No. I'm curious how I would do that if I wanted more levels, uh, more layers here, but this, this accomplishes what I want. I can pass in anything that has a slice of slices as a reference. So that's what I'm doing. I'm passing in a reference to a vector of vectors, and it will coerce that into the um, correct type. So we'll, we'll have A, and I can demonstrate that by saying this will be an I, this. I think this is equal to A dot into, uh, or B as rev. Actually, the inside is, I'm going to have to do asref on the inside. Yeah, it's going to be kind of annoying. Um, whatever. I, we'll see. I'm, I'm just playing around because this is like using generics to handle more input types. Uh, is something that I've been wanting to get into more and more. So what I want to do is I want to do a convolution, a convolution between two things, although they're not going to have multiple... Um, I actually want to handle the sliding myself, so we're, we're, we're going to get rid of this anyways. Uh, 
We're going to do a convolution of, of two things, and we're going to go through all of them, and we're going to return an I64, which is the result of everything. So we're going to go for a, b, in a dot iter dot zip b dot iter. Uh, actually, we can do... Uh, we can do this in a one-liner. A dot iter dot zip dot b dot iter dot fold zero i sixty four and then the function that we're gonna use is gonna take an a b and then this will take a multiply it by b and we'll do a, a checked mol and then this will have an accumulator here uh, we'll do a dot checked mol b act dot checked add those and dot unwrap dot unwrap we just want to make sure we don't have overflows because we're working with fixed size i64s here okay so we're just going to look at we're going to have to process this data more but we're just going to say uh one 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 with one two three four and i just need to ref those Okay, so now we have a convolution here, and I can print, this should be uh, 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1, which would be uh, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, I got to tend to my makers and tibia. Doop, doop, doop. Okay, so now we have that. We print the convolution. We got 10. Looks good. If we changed, uh, let's see what happens. I think this will just go with whatever shorter for the amount of data. So that's got six now. Um, same if we did this. I think if this one is shorter, uh, yes. So it will just stop at whatever one's shortest. That's fine. That's what we want. So this is going to just going to go through all of the points, multiply them together, uh, and then it's going to sum them up looks good and then it's all checked ads so if there's any integer overflows or underflows uh, that will fail catastrophically and then we don't have to worry about those so now i need to kind of process this data so this white space parser processed it into um uh it, it just processes it into a really really simple shape so what i want to do is i want to find I'm going to go and push these out into a vector. I know that these are in order, so now I know the, the um, roughly the shape of this. So we're going to go into four frequency. Or actually, ooh, I don't know if they've made this syntax stable yet. We'll, we'll see. Um, four frequency, or four cycle frequency in a dot data dot iter. Um... into actually I can I can do this no I probably can't no I can't never mind all right never mind uh, we'll just say stuff uh, for stuff then we'll do print this should be the perfect okay that's what I want and then what we'll do is let mute uh, we're gonna call this process data and this will take in data this will be our we can say this is specific at this point it doesn't really matter this is going to output a flattened version with all the cycles accounted for so it takes in data which provides tuples of uh, cycle and frequency and generates a vector which is indexed by cycle count and contains the frequency. For stuff in, it's just this. For stuff in data dot, data dot enter, then I'm going to go through and we're going to uh, assert data dot is equal to two. 
then let freak is equal to data of zero, uh, or frequency here, cycle is there. Uh, and then I think I can do let mute ret is vec new. Ret dot resize 0i64 to cycle as u size. I need to make sure that I can convert that to a u size safely. Use standard convert try into. That's going to perform a conversion of an i64 into a u size, so that will fail if there's negatives or if there's truncation of that. Okay, so that will resize the vector to uh, to be zero padded, I think, to have that to a length of that size, and I can get rid of this. Okay, uh, and it is this one first, and then the value to resize with if there isn't a value present. And I'm going to assume that all the data is in order. Um, data is oh stuff. Okay, so now that's gone through. That'll resize it, and then I should be able to write afterwards cycle.push uh, or ret.push frequency. So that will push it at that index. So it will resize it to that. So if the cycle is zero, then the resize does nothing. We'll push it, and then the zeroth element in there will be the frequency. So that should convert that data to what we want. Let a is equal to process data a dot data b dot data and now we have two things which will be uh, both just vectors of i thirty twos and assertion failed uh oh uh oh. Um, hmm. Somehow I made a backtick file. Okay, uh, 6,000 looks good. I'm guessing it's going to be an empty new line at the end. No. That's really strange. Oh, stuff.line is too. Okay, so we have two data sets. This one's more zero padded than this one because this one has data which occurs sooner. Now we can do a convolution between those two. Or I guess that maybe, yeah, this, is this the convolution? The convolution might be the output rather, like the, the total graph output rather than just the single point of data. We're treating this as the single point of data. Okay, so that is their like overlap value at this and then I'm just gonna do for index in, I guess I want to slide, how much do I want to slide them by? Uh, this is zero dot dot. Do I want to figure out which one is biggest? I think, I think I want to figure out which one is the bigger data set. And the bigger one is the one that will stay, and the smaller one is what I'll slide on top. And I'm trying to think if I need to slide it beyond a point. I might need to pad out this data with kind of more crap at the end. Uh, let uh, large is equal to if, or let, yeah, we'll just do let small large. Uh, we'll do haystack and needle. That is going to be equal to if a dot len is greater than b dot len, then it's going to be the big one is a and the small one is b, else b a. And then haystack, needle, the ordering doesn't matter there. And then I should be able to say, Right, if the A length is greater than the B length, then the haystack is A, and then we don't care about the equal to situation. And then here I can say for slide 
in zero dot dot haystack dot len. We'll slide the needle by that amount. Um, and I guess we might have to pad it with zeros. Maybe I should use vec dqs for this then. Might be faster. I mean, yeah, I don't know. We, we don't have that much data to process. So I'm going to slide that data. I want to do this. I want to print the slide amount. And here I want to print the convolution. Uh, we'll do slide. And then I guess, can I just do this? That's going to go out of bounds. Yeah. Might be fine, though. I, I might want to pad them all out a little bit. I'm not quite sure. This doesn't look correct. This doesn't look correct. Is that doing what I want it to do? I don't think so. No, I think that kind of is. I can slide the other one. Maybe I should just think about it instead of just trying random things, but uh, let's see what this looks like. Okay, and we'll pipe that to less. That one looks better. So this is saying they're like peak. Uh, the peak match is at when we slide one of them to this like 741. So let's take a look at what that looks like. One second. Doop, doop, doop. Oops. All right, so what I could do is, I mean, I can just graph this quick. Uh, Data.txt, fim plot dot plot, plot data.txt, u12 with line. Uh, genu plot persist plot dot plot. Well, that's a nice peak. That's really nice. That's got a really nice spike. Um, and that slide amount must be where they line up the most. So what I should be able to do then is I can take the plot from previously, plot load sequence to here. And uh, I'm going to get rid of all these arrows. And hopefully it just, I think this is going to have, yeah, it's just going to have that data. I need to get rid of the normals, and I closed the wrong terminal. That kind of sucks. Oops. We'll get that set back up. Okay, CD. Um, luckily, I didn't have anything too crazy. Okay. Carrier run, that's going to process that into data, that's fine. Python or GNU plot persists plot load sequence. Okay, and I just want to get rid of the normals. Uh, it's going to be my best way of doing this. Is this going to be the easiest way? Yeah, I think so. So we want 6,000. So we'll delete that. We want 6,000 and 8,000. Can delete everything else. Okay. Perfect. So this is saying that if I shift one of them by, I don't know which one it is, but if I shift one of them by whatever that peak was. So let's find let com is equal to this. Let 
let me max com is equal to OI64. Max com is equal to standard compare max between the conv and the max conv. And here we'll print the convolution. Print. Uh, max conv. And then if that happens, let mute slide max is equal to none. Ah, uh, we actually need an if. If the conv is greater than max conv, then slide max is equal to sum slide max conv is equal to conv. Uh, slide max at this slide max dot unwrap. And, oh, that's why something's off. I, I must have nuked a parenthesis somewhere or a curly. Uh, is this just going to tell me? 86 unexpected close there, here. Okay, slide max at 219. So the highest, the highest overlap was at 219. And what I could do is... Hmm. How do I want to plot that? Is there a way to shift the axis on Genie Plot? Actually, I can do this. So we want 219 as our magic number. We're going to take this minus 219. It might need it might be the other one uh, that needs to change. It is. We made it worse. I'll add 219. There we go. And then we're going to just uh, get rid of this. Okay. So this is what it said was the maximum overlap. And we indeed see a pretty significant, um, like they're doing the same damn things. And let me see if uh, lines is going to hurt this. We'll use lines instead of dots. This might make it look really ugly. Oops. I don't remember if with L is at the end. Expecting title for plots. Oh, it, oh uh, Vim put this on new lines. Uh, with L. Set. Man, why is it formatting that? Sex, uh, set the text width is equal to this. There you go. All right. So that is the maximum overlap that it found with the convolution. And that, I would say that lines up pretty well. Like, that's, that's really interesting um, and cool. So... Okay. Wow. Interesting. So what I'm thinking is that what I could do is I could use the convolutions as an oracle. And basically I could automatic... So I could issue like one load or two loads very early on in the process to get a sampling of what a load port A and a load port B graph look like. And then I would use like very unique values for those intentionally in my sampling code. And then I would use those values to determine the shape of subsequent um, graphs such that I could use, like I have an oracle to use as a convolution. And then I can use that to find the peaks. And then anywhere there's a significant enough peak in the convolution because you saw the spike was very high. I can use that to determine the cycle count of that Thing, if that makes sense. Uh, I'm going to take a bio break and then I'll try to re-explain that. I'll be right back.
All right, here we go. Those graphs look scary similar. Yeah, exactly. That's like, that's what I noticed when I was taking a look. Um, so that was, was what was kind of interesting. It's like when I saw those peaks, if we go back to the original data, um, one second. Okay, cool. So if we look at the original data, genu plot p plot load sequence. So this is the original data. Um, and I need to put this in floating mode. There we go. Okay. So when we looked at this original data, uh, we saw like a lot of similars, similarities between these different peaks. And so that kind of got me off on this tangent of how similar are they. So we wrote this convolution code that allowed us to see uh, genu plot persist plot dot plot. So it allowed us to see that between, so we isolated two different samples. We're looking at specifically the 6,000 in circle, this circle, and then this triangle in black which is the 8,000, we've isolated those out, we've then slid them across each other performing a convolution. That is the output of the convolution is this graph, which is telling us that at this 219 cycles is when they have the most in common. Um, what's really nice about this is that this is a very sharp peak. This is super, super sharp, and that means that it's a lot easier for, like, compared to the sharpness of these peaks, or these peaks, which are really bad, the sharpness of these, uh, it's, it's a lot better. So what I effectively want to do is I want to use, I want to perform some of these loads initially as oracles to then determine these convolution patterns. And then I want to slide these across, and then I want to plot the convolutions rather than the actual loads. Um, and then hopefully we'll have a graph that will consist of peaks like this instead of peaks like this crap. Because this is like uh, the width between this where there's like just all of this noise here. This is like hundreds of cycles. And the peak here, it only spans a, a, a couple cycles. And this gives us a lot cleaner of a line to draw through. Um, so effectively, that's kind of where we are. We have these two different uh, like modes that we're going to have to perform those convolutions on, probably depending on what load port we're leaking from. Um, but uh, this data looks really good. And I expect if I did this same convolution on 1,000 and 3,000, I would see similar things. Actually, I'm going to do... Uh, yeah, actually, all the convolutions between almost all of these flat top ones will be similar. Let's try a let's try to do two thousand this X's with um with eight thousand the black one and see how much those overlap because those are kind of differing uh, to a decent amount. So that was two thousand. So let's compare two thousand to eight thousand. So we're gonna copy in from before one three three seven or this. 2,000 to here, uh, plot, uh, we're just over here, we're just going to change this, comparing 2,000 to 8,000 now, cargo run, and we can take a look at, yeah, so even when they don't have as much of the same shape, they're still very similar, and there's a lot of components to that, to their similarities that aren't just their primary peaks. And when you're when you're looking at it as a human, uh, it's a math operation. Yeah, it's a convolution. Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, convolution is basically you take two different graphs, you you slide them across each. So you you take two graphs you multiply all of the points so that everything gets amplified or whatever. They basically constructive interference between two graphs. And then you sum up the area under the curve. You basically add up all the points and then you slide them and you do that step by step by step by step by step by step to see when the interference is the maximum. And when the interference is the maximum means when the points lined up the most. So the negative points were more negative, the positive points were more positive, whatever. And they, and they slide across like that. Um, I think maybe you're supposed to square or do absolute values, but since we're only working with positives, we just don't need to worry about that. So here, this is showing us that between these different points, actually, is this right? That's not the right data. I need to do this. 
uh, data.txt. Here we go. Yeah. So it's still really sharp. We have this point here that's a little bit, it's not as like clean the whole way, but it's still plenty sharp up top. Uh, like the, the window here, um, oh, I closed that terminal again. Uh, oops. Hmm. Okay. Uh, CD, Sushiro, CPU graphing, convolutions, car run, data.txt. Genu plot persist plot the plot. So we have the like this peak here. If I measure this, this peak, even at like this threshold, this is only like a couple cycles across. Uh, let me zoom into. Does it allow zooming? I know it does on Windows, but it, apparently it doesn't on this. Um, like this, like the zoom button just doesn't do anything. Um, kind of weird, okay. But this peak is a lot sharper, and that from basically saying, uh, where was the original data? Back. So if we do genu plot p on uh, plot load sequence, we're basically, and we gotta turn this into floating mode again. So, I want to say how far apart is the, this black load from this load in the circle. And the difference between these, to a human, you can kind of eyeball like this is where they overlap. But to a computer, we need to do a little bit of processing to figure out where those are. So um, honestly, if we look at this when we have, when we're not in, um, uh, parse. If we turn off log scale, the peaks will be a little bit more pronounced. There we go. Here it is in, in uh, without log scale. We see these like peaks here, which are relatively sharp. Um, but it's not, it, it's still a little bit difficult to try to determine when these things have the most in common. Because while these peaks, we could measure the maximum from this to the maximum of this, while that works just fine and dandy, um, what we really would like to do is get this average and find where they overlap the most and then compare their overlapping points with each other rather than comparing some arbitrary single maximum point. We want to get kind of the weighted distance between these two. And these convolutions is effectively giving us that weighted distance because it's taking into effect the overlapping of all points, even the ones that as a human, like we, as a human, we're looking for these top, these big standoffish points. But there might be a lot of points in here that truly add up and add up to making these overlap more at a certain different point. So it's important for us to to go about it from a more statistical, mathematical approach than a human approach. So that's what we're trying to do is just sharpen up these peaks such that instead of drawing these stupid normal curves, which mean nothing, we'll hopefully have a lot sharper curves. Any humans in chat? No, 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 no. No humans here. Okay. <laughs> Sweet. So, uh, one thing that's Difficult is I'm going to need to categorize these like different convolutions these two different shapes because I don't want to I don't want to use this shape on blue and I don't want to use this uh, and vice versa Right because we have these kind of two different shapes that we're getting for sampling. I don't know why but we are um, So I want to kind of bucket them and it's even and odd. So once again, it's similar It's gonna be related to load port things uh so, yeah, what's interesting here is the yellow load looks like it's probably happening after this circle load, but when you weight them and make these normals in the weighted means, the yellow happens actually before uh, this one. But there's still just a lot of noise, so I'm hoping the convolutions will make that a little cleaner. I don't know. Maybe it won't. Maybe, maybe these means, these weighted means, are as good as we're going to get. Maybe these weighted means are mathematically identical to the convolutions, and they'll just, um, 
and they'll be at the exact same points on the graph, but I don't think that's gonna be the case. So what do I wanna do? How do I wanna do this? So I need to generate convolutions for all of these different graphs. Um, let's do it, let's start off simple. So I'm gonna go into the convolutions cargo run cp dot dot slash star lead star dot text dot. Okay, so now we have all the data in this folder. So now what I can do is I can always process, we're gonna always use 1000, that's one of the square ones uh, as that. And then this one's gonna be dynamic. So, and this will be format, this, and then here we're gonna do for uh, val in OS elite 1000 to inclusive 8000 uh, dot step by 4096. We're gonna go through and perform the convolutions for all of them separately. So going through all those, doing these convolutions. Uh, it's the same pattern. Uh, convolution is edge detection image processing. Yeah, it actually is. Um, it is. Convolution is also effectively what like fast Fourier transforms are. So when you try and do like a, it, it's more similar to like a discrete Fourier transform, but effectively you, you generate a thousand hertz sine wave, you slide that across your data, you see what the peaks are, you then do that with one thousand or a thousand and one hertz and a thousand two hertz and you keep sliding them across um, and that's how you can build kind of the spectrum the frequency f spectrum so yeah it's very similar okay so we're loading that one which is a fixed one and then this one we're performing these convolutions and we're just gonna do this oh, and i didn't like this because we probably need to give it an argument Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of these prints temporarily and just look at the slide maxes. So this is showing me basically where the best overlaps are for certain points. So this is saying that the zeroth one, so the first one, so keep in mind zero has now been normalized to the, um, let me see, where do I have a graph here? I'm gonna pull it up on a, another terminal here. We'll do, uh, Stream term here, sushi roll, uh, CPU graphing, and then we'll go into um, Python parse load sequence. Okay, so this is the data that we're working with. And what this is saying is these are the slides for the different data. Uh, and we're always using the 1000 as an oracle in this case. So 1000 is this blue, so we're using or this purple. The, the purple plus is what we're using as the kind of origin and everything else is gonna be rel uh, relative to that. So this is saying that the most we have in common with the second peak, which will be green, even though we're not printing it, we just know it's gonna be green, is going to be at 71 offset. So what's interesting is that with our previous normal sort of thing, we would say that the distance between this peak, the peak of the purple is at 186 and the peak of this green is at 206, so 20 apart. Um, but the convolutions are saying that the peaks of the convolutions are actually separated by about 70 there, um, which is a lot wider of a window and that kind of holds up through some of these other points. Now, since we have two different shapes there, uh, we're kind of getting really weird data by doing that. Uh, so what I wanna do is have kind of more in common with these shapes. So let's do, um, we could filter out the data or we could try and find which one has the higher convolution. Uh, so this could be uh, conv A or like uh, Oracle A and Oracle B. And we're gonna pick two of the good shapes. We're gonna pick the yellow one, uh, which is 5,000, and then this one, which is 6,000. So we're gonna use 5,000 for one, 
6,000 for the other. And so we're going to load both of those up. We're going to process them in a similar way. So Oracle A and Oracle B. Uh, Oracle A and Oracle B. Oracle Oracle B. This will be the compare. And then we'll chain convert that one as well to compare. Um, in this case, I don't think we're going to care about that anymore. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, normalize data. So we're going to do, and we don't need to reload these oracles every single time. That's just a waste of CPU resources. So we'll just do this. And then we're going to normalize the data. We're going to normalize it by doing uh, oracle a dot resize uh, 0 i64. And then the, oh, it's the other way around. I always get that confused which way it is. And we're just going to, we're just going to set the lengths of all of these to 2000, which is larger than, than any of our data. And we're just going to pad these out with zeros. In fact, we'll go to 4,000 because I just don't care. Normalized data set widths. So they all start at zero. Then we're going to pad them out to 4,000 with zeros. So they're always the same size. Now we don't have this concept of needles and haystacks. So here we're going to do uh, a convolution of uh, these two different ones. So I want to do multiple convolutions at the same time. This will allow us to kind of determine which ones have the most in common. So let's see what we can do here. Um, do, 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 do. And slide max. So the best slide, this is now going to be, we're going to slide the comparison data against Oracle A temporarily. So this should just work. This should be the same as before, except for a bunch of dots. So this will be uh, compare that one. Okay, and then that is uh, mute on all of these. We'll just do that. We'll leave it at that. Okay. Uh, unwrap on a non value if the conv is greater than the max convolution. Um. Process data, resize, slide, compare, slide by slide, Oracle A. Why does this not work as the previous one did? That's unwrapping. That means it didn't find a max, which means all of these were zero. Oracle A resize, B resize, and compare resize. Um, why would that be the case? Oh, uh, hmm. Oh, I need a. I need to be able to slide. No, they should all be origined at zero. I don't understand how they all are multiplying with zero the whole way through. I'm sliding that one all the way over. I'm doing something stupid here. Uh. We'll just print the values. Are there any negatives in here? Less. So it's always zero. Is that a fluke? We got 5,000, we've got that, so we're going through. Is it because it's before us? But I don't understand. Oh yeah, we're always sliding this past. So which everyone has data before, yeah. So if I did this, I think it'll work. Did it? Yeah. Yep. So, and the reason for that is the, um, do I need to slide both? Or do I just need to find which one starts and ends before the other? So the problem is I was sliding one just beyond the other, so they never had anything in common because the uh, the data set I was sliding back 
actually came after the first one. So I just kept pushing it back and multiplying zeros with everything. Um, so I could do a negative slide amount. Well, so I could do first slide in uh, compare.len as i size negative to compare.len as i size. And then here I could say uh, if the slide is less than zero, then we do this. Otherwise, uh, dot abs as you size. Otherwise, we do this. Is there a better way of doing this? Maybe. Ah. And then this one, we'll just do slide as you size. And we'll make these. Uh, oops. Okay, so now we have some negatives in there. And then we have some positives. And I think I have those opposite. I actually want to do this. Say if it's greater than or equal to zero, we'll do that. Okay, so the negative, this will show how much we need to shift. So this is saying we need to shift the comparison one, which is 1,000. Uh, actually, I did want the other way. This is the way I wanted. Okay. Uh, so this is saying that all of these are negative. So the positive one, so this is showing that I need to slide the, I need to move the 1000 graph, the first data file we're parsing, I need to move it to the right on the graph. I need to add this amount to it to get to the certain, to the point that I want, which looks good. And then here, if the convolution is greater than max comp, that one's fine. That's not going to go negative. Uh, but then that is good. And then slide max is just going to latch the value, the slide amount at that location. And we can get rid of the pipe and we can get rid of this print. Time to do a release build. OK. So this is showing for all of the different data files. Uh, we can do val, no such file or directory. Uh, I guess we don't want equal. Okay, so this is showing that 1,000 needs to be slid forwards, 2,000 needs to be slid backwards, 3,000 or, or forwards, 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 and then these need to be slid backwards. Um, I don't get the B, C, D, E, F here, why those are positive. I don't get that at all. Why would the, are those even on our graph? Oh, that data is stale. The B, C, D, E, F. Yeah, that data is still. Uh, this just wasn't part of our last sample. I was about to say that makes no sense. Okay, there we go. That looks good. Uh, yeah, I won't find that directory. Whoop de doo. Okay, so that's finding those. Peaks, slide max 464. Huh. Huh. That is kind of interesting. Oops. One second, tending to my tibia characters again. That is, I think that's because we're comparing the weird ones 
we're comparing like the two different shapes with each other and that's gonna cause us some issues. Um, oh, I actually just hit axe or shielding 90. Which is the first on the server. Woo! Okay. I'm just gonna... Okay. So, if I were to change this to use Oracle B instead of Oracle A, we'll probably see slightly different data. Yeah, so now we're seeing 524, 457, 291, 218, 0, blah, blah, blah. So I might want to just do convolutions between both. And let's see which one, whichever is best. So conv A, this will be with Oracle A. I know there's code duplication here, it's fine. We're, we're really just trying to learn if this is a good technique, if this is something we care about. That conv is equal to standard compare max conv A, conv B. That's not good. Because that's only going, that'll, oh, that'll keep the maximum for each. Uh, technically, I think this will work. So this will find the maximum between the two convolutions per data point. But the one that matches better should overweigh and exceed. And we just need a semicolon here. Oracle A, Oracle B, B, conv B, A, B. That's greater than that. Okay. So now we have, wow, that's kind of interesting. Didn't expect that. I didn't expect that. Mm, that's gonna be an issue due to the magnitude of some of these peaks. So some of the peaks of the A is different than the peaks for the B. And that will cause any time that you do a convolution with A, it's going to have higher peaks than B. Um. So I will have to normalize these somehow. And I don't know how I want to do that. Um, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's kind of a, a tough one. So... How do I do that? Do I just, do I, do I want to normalize them to a peak? But how do I figure out which ones have a better shape? Like which one shapes match up more? Is that the sharpness of the peak of the convolution? Uh... So I effectively want to go through and I want to figure out which ones they are most similar to. So I want to go through, so in this case, we have 16 different uh, data points or, or, or values that we're observing. And I want to go through and do the convolutions of one with all the others to find out which one has the most similar shape and then use that to compare them on the time domain. So I want to basically, I want to go through and compare purple with every different one, every single one, find which one purple has most in common with shape-wise, then use that as a reference point to determine how far apart they are and then plot that distance. So I'm basically trying to do a shape relative comparison. I, I, I wanna figure out which ones I'm similar to and then assume that the ones that I'm similar to have the sharpest timing differences. So for example, if we were to look at, at purple, purple obviously is going to have the strongest uh, correlation with the, this blue because they both have this very uh, square wavy boxy shape. Now, purple will have more and similar to yellow and red than it will to orange, which has a completely different shape, but it'll still have more in common with this. And by knowing that these two share the most common shape, then I'll compare these relatively. 
and I'll use that to try to create a new time domain based on the relative differences. So we'd say that blue is origin, which would be zero, or purple is origin at zero. And then this one is most similar to purple, and thus we'd do the convolution, we'd find the max value of the convolution, and then that value, which would be the offset between these two, would be the distance that we would want to put two different lines on a graph of seeing when those loads occurred. If that makes sense. Um, so that's kind of what I want to do, but I don't know how to deal with these unless I normalize them. But I feel like normal. I feel like I need to normalize the data against each other. I could clamp everything to like a hundred and just say the max value for any like just squish them to a hundred for everything. <coughs> but I don't know if that's going to be fair for these boxy ones that persist for a really long time. I think they still might have a higher convolution. I, I don't I don't actually know like I think the sharpness of the convolution is what I want. Do I want to look for the smallest standard deviation on the convolution? If I do the convolution and then I do the standard deviation of that convolution of the um of genie plots persist plot dot plot. So this is the convolution graph. And basically the convolution between um between the square boxy one and the the non-square one, they'll the square one will have a higher absolute value. The peak will be higher in its convolution, but it, I will ex I would expect it would be a wider convolution. So let's uh, let's let's uh, try and prove that point. So we're gonna do a comparison between three thousand and everything else. So we'll do a three thousand here, and we're gonna do we're gonna print conv a and conv b as two different values. Same slide. Okay, so, and that needs to be dot dot equals uh, seven three thousand. So we're going, this will be the data just for three thousand, comparing against the two oracles at five thousand and six thousand. Uh, data dot text, genie plot, uh, plot dot plot. Here we'll do uh, set term x. Uh, that with L and then U13 with L. Uh, genu plot P plot dot plot. Okay, so, and I'm gonna put uh, X1, Y2. Is that right? Uh, with lines. X1, Y2. How do I do that? Plot load sequence. Axes. Okay. Oops. Axes. Wow, those are surprisingly similar. I'm kind of surprised. So what I, what I did here is I did the two convolutions against the, uh, so we're taking the, we're looking at, we are looking at the 3000, which is this blue square one. And we're comparing this with 5,000 in yellow and this 6,000 in this uh, whatever this circle color is. Um, and I'm doing the convolutions between two of those and plotting them. And we see that the peak is higher. Um, okay, so this data has been normalized. Uh, 
which is interesting because I don't know why they don't have the same peaks on the graph. Since I have them on separate y-axis, they should... We know that they have completely different peaks, but what I'm trying to figure out is how do I use these to determine which ones have a more similar shape? And I think the standard DV, like if I treat these as a normal, if I treat these as a normal distribution and then I look for the standard deviation, which one would have the smaller standard deviation? Because I would expect that this would have a lot more in common with the yellow than it does with this one, but the data looks very similar. Am I doing that right? Conv A and Conv B. They are surprisingly similar. But what's difficult here is that the peaks are different. So the peak here is at like 291 and the peak here is at uh, 220, and I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom into these a lot more actually. Um, set X range. Uh, what did I say? Like 200, 150. Let's say 150 to 300. Take a look at there. Um, you can normalize against the convolutions of the highest and lowest point to find that average. Then normalize. Yeah. So I was thinking I could do that, um, and then normalize all data based on that. So that's what I'm trying. I'm trying to avoid normalizing the data because I'm a little concerned that that might cause like really faint things to get amplified in ways that they shouldn't. So I'm trying to look for more uh, like distributions, although it's probably a very similar operation. So we have to zoom out a little bit on this. Uh, we're going to go to 0 to 500. So... What's, what's really scary to me here is one of these shows a peak at like 228 and one shows a peak at 290. And we want to be able to use these to determine the, the deltas between these samples. I mean, do I just do a convolution against everything, find the peak? So I would like, I could potentially do the convolution against everything in the graph. So in this case, We'd take purple and we'd do a convolution against every single thing here. And we would use that to get the distance between all of these different locations and then get the average of that. Because what I could do is, is by the peak of the convolution, I could say that blue is, a, is 50 cycles from green and, and, blue, or, and purple is 100 cycles from blue, and it's 150 from this, and I have 200 from this, and I would learn like how far apart all of these are from one another. And with that information, I could then go and just like try to find the best fit then between all of that data. I think that is probably the best model here. Because, yeah, then it would compare against everything. It would be general purpose. It wouldn't rely on us knowing that there are two modes and, and picking between the best ones. And it would literally just enumerate all of these, and then we would know that, like, purple thinks it's this far from all these, these think they're this far from all of these, so on and so forth. And I think we only have to run through the data twice. Um, like, 16 squared would be worst case because we'd run through each different data sample for each, but there will be duplicates in there because the mirror is just the inverse. Um, so I think, is this 16 times 2? Is it only 32 different ones? No. No. I think this is 8 times 16. We have to, we have to compare half of them with everything. be factorial, of, uh, 16 factorial. Is that true, 16 factorial? Yeah, it is, it is. Okay. So I think the best way to handle factorials is to just um, eliminate those sets. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna go through for the values and this range to this inclusive. We're gonna try and load it. Um, if it fails to load, uh, so let compares equal to this. 
if compare dot is error continue. So that's just going to uh, soft fail if we can't load that data. Um, now we're back to A and B. So we're going to load up A. We're going to load up B. Data set of A and data set of B. I know we can pre-process this, but I'm not too worried about perf yet. Uh, we could move those out of the loop and process them and not load the file every time we need to access the data because we're going to re-access a bunch. So we're going to normalize the data set widths. Still want to do that. A and B. We're then going to process A and B. Uh, process the data into the requested shape. Um, this is going to be load the data. This is going to be A. So load up A. Load up B. And here I can say print comparing with A and B. We don't know the file names anymore. I probably want to keep that. AFN, BFN, AFN, BFN. Print comparing X with X, A, F, N, B, F, N. Then we're going to do the same thing here. We're just going to find the peaks. That's all we care about. Uh, put that tabbed in one. Going to get rid of these multiple convolutions. We're going to do a convolution between... The convolution is just going to be A with B and A with B. That'll find those distances. We'll get that data. Cargo run. Yep, so a lot of the stuff is broken now. Uh, this will just be a len to a len. They're the same length. Data. Unwrap. That might be fine because we only use it once, but it, borrow checker might not be happy with that. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Nice, so we perform all those comparisons, comparing that with that, and we'll just print that. Uh, distance is this, and this will just be the slide max dot unwrap. So we try and find the biggest uh, convolution, the peak in the convolutions between those, and then we're just going to accumulate that. Okay. So this is saying it thinks purple is these distances from all these other points. So it thinks that, oh, beautiful. Okay, so that's good data. Let me see if I can kind of fit this on the screen. So this is comparing purple with itself. So purple to green, it says is 154 cycles apart. Uh, one second. Runes go by fast in Tibia when I'm not actually playing, when I'm distracted by work. Okay. So, the, dif the distance between this and itself is zero, obviously, good. The distance between 0 and 1,000 is 154. 0 and 2,000 is 179. So 0 and 2,000, uh, 179. So that's the distance between the purple. So let's say the purple, let's find the first value over 1,000. Let's say it's like right here is 70 to here, which is about 311. So 311 minus 70. It's 241. That's interesting. 
So I would say, based on that, that they're 70 to 313? Did I type it in wrong? 313 to 70, 243 apart. But this is saying that their maximum peak in a convolution is actually at 179, which is really interesting because that is a lot different than as a human what I interpret the data to be. So this might be more correct or more incorrect, I'm not sure. Um, but it's mathematically the strongest correlation it has uh, with with the other blue, right? Yeah. Oh, we're comparing. Uh, whoa, we don't want to compare the zero. The zero is that's bad data. This data is gone. This is not part of our data set. Uh, this is yeah. There we go. I'll run it twice so I can scroll. There we go. That would make much more sense. I was like, that That doesn't line up. Okay, so we, we speculated that these two, eyeballing it, are 243 apart, and this is saying they're 238 apart. That is good. Nice. Nice. Uh, couldn't you, in theory, pick the most similar sets of data in each mode, grab the average of the highest peak between both in a single mode, and then do the average between modes? That wouldn't blow the noise through the roof, and it wouldn't decimate the shapes of the data. Yeah, that was kind of the initial attempt. Um, so I'm, I'm going with this approach because it will allow things to kind of uh, we're gonna build the similar. We're gonna basically build the similarities or the distances that these things think they have with one another, and then we can use that to try to combine each other. So like, orange thinks it's 150 cycles from circle, and purple thinks it's x amount of cycles from orange. Thus, like, how much it, does that match up? So let's actually do one of these comparisons. Because this is, this is what I'm interested in. Um, so let's say we want to compare purple. We want to compare purple to blue to yellow. We're going to go purple to blue to yellow. So we're going to find the distance of purple to blue and blue to purple and see if that's similar to purple to yellow. Um, so we know that... Uh, I'm just going to use my calculator to kind of store these as notes. So we've got purple to blue is 1,000 to 3,000. So 1,000 to 3,000 is a 238 distance. And blue, which is 3,000 to yellow, which is 5,000. So we want 3,000 to 5,000, which is 3,000 to 5,000 is 227. So 238 plus 227 is 465. So the distance between those, by going through one another, uh, is 465. But the distance between 1,000 and 5,000 directly is, oh, it's exactly 465. Um, is that a coincidence or is that guaranteed mathematically? I feel like that's probably a, a coincidence. Is it? Is that guaranteed? I would expect them to be very close, such that a, that a coincidence is possible. Um, but I don't know. What I would like to see is that it would slightly disagree, because, like, the shape deteriorates, right? So let's just add more nodes. Let's go through, and let's go all the way to uh, this blue, this 9,000. So we're going to go directly from 1,000 to 9,000. It said, uh, and we have some data clipping there, so let's go to just red. So red is 7,000. So 1,000 to 7,000 is 691 is the full distance. So let's go 1,000 to 3,000. 238. Uh, 3,000 to 5,000. 227. And then 5,000 to 7,000. 5,000 to 7,000 is 223. 
688, and the total length is 691. Uh, so that is actually what I wanted to see. I wanted to see that by chaining these together, I get a different value of going directly. So the convolution between directly between purple and red is different than the distance between this best fit with this and this best fit with this and this best fit with this. And the reason why, uh, well, the reason why is, is obvious the data shape changes. But what's interesting is that the 691 distance, which is the distance between the purple and the red directly via convolution, I think that number is less accurate than the 688 which is the distance between purple and blue and blue and yellow and yellow and red. And the reason because of that is we, we have more data points with different levels of noise and different shapes that we're traversing. So we're bringing in, in my opinion, more signal by not doing a direct comparison between two, but by kind of traversing through because the, the convolution between yellow and red is going to be a lot more accurate than the convolution between purple and red. Because red and yellow have a lot more in common, if that makes sense. Is that, is that stupid? None of this is, is like actual statistical mathy things. This is just me like trying to logic through this. I don't like, I don't know if I'm committing a cardinal fallacy here by thinking that. But, um... So what I want to do is I actually want to take all these points. I don't want to go from purple to blue to yellow to red. I want to go from purple to green. to I want to get all these different paths because all of these have associations. And I could actually go through and find the average distance between purple and red via all comparisons. So that would include going directly there, include traversing through certain patterns in different ways, and I would be really interesting. Like family, think of it as immediate versus di distant. Deviation widens the further you travel. Yeah. I don't know. I, so what I, what I think I want to do is I, I have this data. This is, the data has actually been compressed quite a bit, which is good because this data is, this is a lot to process. And this now is just a couple lines of of a single values. This is actually a scalar data set. Well, technically it, it's three values per because I need to know the source and destination to associate these. Um, so what I wanna do is I wanna take, God, I, first of all, this graph is just gorgeous. <laughs> like this, the fact that we're getting data like this out of processor undefined behavior and noise is so cool. Like, like we forcibly put these peaks in here, the, the separation between these things, because we added a delay. But I'm hoping that whatever magic and processing we do is going to actually help it when we remove that delay. And that's going to be testing our hypothesis. That's going to be our, our, like, validation of did we actually make it better or did we just make it better in the one case that we were looking at it as a human? Because that doesn't mean anything in science. Okay, so we're going to put that graph over to another screen, and we have this. So, I have this data now of these comparisons. So let's, uh, let's put this in let mute um, distances. Would you say this is a side channel attack? It absolutely is. Um, Although it's it's more of a, a like vulnerability because we're getting information we shouldn't get at all from the processor, so it it's it's definitely a CPU bug itself. So if I do distances, I'm gonna do hash map to a hash map of, and I'm gonna use a B tree map. I don't like hash maps. I'm gonna do a B tree map, even though hash maps are faster. And then this is going to be a U64, a U64, and an I64. And this mapping is going to be uh, 
the graphs remind me of power output graphs from power side channel attacks. Yes, uh, actually this, this logic that I'm applying to this is very similar to some work that I've done. I did some very early on like side channel attacks, like leaking things via RF emissions from processors. Um, and I use very similar techniques as I'm doing here. In fact, um, it's just when I see data with similar problems, I use similar tools to fix them. Now what sucks is that uh, there might be a much better way to do this and I might never find that because I'm going to climb the hill that I know the peak of. Uh, so that's something to be really dangerous of when it comes to perspectives and experts and, and, and people who have really good success and knowledge of things uh, doesn't necessarily mean they're getting the like maximum correctness or doing things in the best way they can. So just always be critical. Standard uh, collections B tree map. Okay, so this is going to be distance uh, distances between from outer set values to inner set values uh, to inner set values internal. Uh, actually, we're just gonna do this. B tree map from value, B tree map to value distance. Okay, so now we're gonna say distances dot entry AFN, the source, dot or inserts, default, default dot entry BFN dot or inserts. Slide max dot unwrap. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Prints distances hex and non hex. Expected I sixty four found an I size. Yeah. Yeah, you did find an eye size, didn't you? No, no, you shouldn't have. Oh, slide max. Uh, slide max. Why is that an eye size? Oh, that makes sense. Whatever. That promotion's safe. Um, oops. Burp. Okay, so the distance between this is this these and blah, 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 and whatever. Okay. Sweet. Let's put a hex in here. Okay, so our distance between, yeah, so A to 1,000, everything's negative. Uh, 9,000, why is that zero? A to 9,000 is seriously zero? Is that is that bad data, kind of? Eight and nine thousand. Yeah, maybe that's just coincidence. Maybe that's just coincidence. Maybe I need to front pad the data too. I pad it on the back, but maybe I need to pad it on the front as well. Um. Because I might, I, I need to like slide it beyond the start. Uh, isn't that what I'm doing here? Sliding A past, sliding B past. I feel like I'm not sliding it enough. Uh, we've got A, we slice it down to cause it to contract in that direction. Is that, is that actually, that's not, let me slide it against B as you sign it. I think they might genuinely just overlap at 9,000. Hmm. Yeah, pattern recognition, yeah. 
Um, that's that's really strange. I'm I'm surprised that that is zero. That's the only one that stands out to me. So eight thousand and nine thousand zero apart. The slide. So this is causing this is causing the A data set to get compared by shrinking it down more and more. Maybe if I do front pad them, if I insert in front of the arrays, um, everything we're doing is relative. So I could do cycle, because if I add more crap out front, might help, maybe? Is, am, am I crazy there? Because everything else should be identical. So if we, if I add more stuff, and the way I can add more stuff is I can just add a thousand to cycle. Actually, we'll add two thousand to cycle. Okay, they're still the same. Uh, let's add. Let's go to eight thousand here. It's gonna slow things down a bit, but who cares? Still the same. Okay, perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to see. Um, okay, so that means that I think we do have this correct. And then this, I'm gonna do a dot one, uh, b dot one. Since we have a n squared here, we're just going to resize them to the, the maximum between the two sizes. I know by the point it gets to here, it's already been resized, so it doesn't matter, but whatever. It's just clean. It's more uh, obvious what the intention is there. So we're going to pad them out with zeros to be the same size. Um, got these man again. Do, 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 do. Okay. So I guess those two, so this is where it gets really interesting because according to these convolutions, it thinks that 9,000 and A, 9,000 thinks A is on top of itself and A thinks 9,000 is on top of itself. But I would suspect that 8,000 thinks 9 and A are different distances from itself. And that's, that's what I want. I want that community voting. I want like 8,000 thinks, 8,000 sees these two, these two as being spaced apart, but they see themselves as on top of each other. So we kind of have like a different observer. Uh, and similarly, we see that 7,000 seems these as, uh, as Distance. So if we, let's put these values, we know that these are actually in order, so this is going to be kind of weird, but we're just going to go by this. So these think they're, they're overlapped. This one thinks they're 219 minus 190 apart, 29 apart. This one thinks they're 4 apart. This one thinks they're 18 apart. This one views them as 455, 442, uh, 13 apart. So they all kind of disagree. And actually, this one... This one thinks that one is before the other. This one actually thinks it's negative three apart. Um, and th wow, this one really sees them as different. This one, wow. 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 Well, shit. Okay, that, that throws a little bit of a curveball into this. Now I could do, I could now figure out these distances. I could chain distances and I could use like the leaps. Um, what I effectively want is, yeah, how do I, do I just like start at a node and then just like follow it and traverse a graph up to like five deep and just randomly do that a couple times? Like start here, pick a random one, go to that one, pick a random one. Like, I could randomly traverse the graph to try to figure out the average distance. I, I know I can exhaustively do it, but I think that might be prohibitively expensive. 
because there are cyclical paths in here. It's it. We're looking at a tree now. Um. God, that's so weird that like data turns into different data, and that's why I like just playing around with stuff like. Because now we totally have a tree. We have a distance from here to to everywhere that it connects to, that, that it has a distance from. But then those also imply a distance that they observe and so on and so forth. And you can get a distance from here to here by going from here to here and then from here to, to there and, and so on and so forth. Um, and how big is that? I think that is that is the 16 factorial. The amount of different ways that I can go from one location to another because this I have 15 options or what however many options to go to and then from there yeah, because they null themselves out. So it it, it is the number of things factorial to enumerate the space exhaustively. Right? Like, if I want to start here, I can pick any of these minus myself. So this, the number of total things, multiplied by 15. And then now I'm in that one, and I want to avoid going back to the very start one. And I also want to avoid going back to the one that I'm in. So then I have, yeah. Yeah, I think this is 16 factorial, or data set factorial. And in this case, our data set is... Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That is a big number, isn't it? Ten factorial. Where do I have it on my fuck it? Do I, I gotta have factorial on here somewhere? Oops, fifteen. I don't think it's on one of the uh, the base keys. Stat. Huh. I don't know where it is in the calculator menus to do factorial. Oh, well, whatever. We'll just do uh, we'll just do ten factorial. That's a big number, but small-ish. Uh, Three point six million. That's doable. Twenty. This is not going to be doable. No, it's not. Okay, so. When we get numbers that are not exhaustively searchable, and I will have data sets that will comprise of more than 20 things, that means we're going to do random searches. So I think we're randomly going to traverse this graph. So now we have the distances, which have been parsed. So we've processed all of those. We know all the distances between everything. Uh, okay, now that I'm not... Wow, was that print really slowing it down that much? No. Okay. So now we have all the distances, and what I can do is I can try and find all the different ways that I can go from one to another. Um, although I'm not going to get the reference points of all of these. Um, hmm. 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 I, yeah, I don't actually know how I want to traverse this. Is this, is this a real uh, computer science problem that I'm buttoning into here? I'm trying to, I, I mean, this is this traveling salesman? Like I'm trying to find all the different ways that I can get from one point to another. I've got different distances between them, and I'm trying to find the different distances and how they add up. Um, what's interesting is that there's data here based on... So if I went into here, went here to 219, that delta would be negative 500. Um, what do I want to do? So I want to say, like, the distance between these two, let's actually see, 680. We're going to look at a couple of these. So 680 to 544 is 924. And this one says 680 to 544 is 895 plus 71. 966. So that has a different view of the distances between those. 
Um, okay. We might just be overly complicating things and just going by the like means and these lines might be the best that we that we can come up with because it is correctly separating them in the sequential order. Um, that is correct, but I, I just, I want to see more uniformity in this graph. So what do I want to do? I want to say like, I want the distance from this to something else. Let from is equal to this. Let to is equal to this. And then I think I'm just going to pick a random node and just see the distance in those two. This isn't going to have the sum. So this is only going to have the individual opinions. So four, uh, we don't really care about the uh, from target to target. And then this we're going to do from desks in distances dot iter for two distance in desks dot iter and we'll just uh, do a couple of these bad boys so these should all just be integers now from to distance okay we can get rid of that nice so we can say uh, I guess we can just do it inside of here. We can say um, desks to target minus desks from target. So we're going to go into the perspectives of each of these, and we're going to print out the distance, but only for that one comparison set. So we're going to say that we have the distance from the two target, subtract the from target, and so this is going to go through all of them. So for the first one, it's going to subtract off zero uh, because it will subtract, what did we do, 680 and 544? Yeah. So it will go into this data set first. It'll look up uh, this entry, the 544, and then this one, which is the from target, subtract them, and that's just going to be 924 minus 0. But from the perspective of other graphs, they might be different. So let's see what we get. Okay. So clearly, the, the, the from and to both agree on 924. And then these are the distances that all of the others see. Um, that range is really wide. That range is scary wide. I feel like that has not helped us at all. 966. Like, if I did a mean here, it would mean nothing because we don't have enough data points here. If I did a median, I... I don't know if that would be too accurate because the median would be like 920, 920, or 915, 901, 901, 915, 920, 924, 924, 27. Actually, median looks pretty solid here. They are kind of clumped. We have a one, we've got like an 85, which is an outlier, and a one that's an outlier, but we have a 27, or a 24, a 27. We should omit this because it's a, a direct duplicate. We have a 20 and a 15. They're all kind of similar. Now, the thing is, if I do the averages of all of them, do they? if I actually do the mean value here instead of the median, does it start to make sense again when I include all of the other data sets? So if I did four from target in... Uh, distances dot keys for two targets and distances dot keys. Okay, so now we're gonna go through all of them and compute that distance. So this is gonna be 
from all perspectives, the differences between points. And distance. Okay. And we'll put uh, we'll put a print here. Just a, a new line. Okay, so this set. They see those two as, okay. That makes sense. We'll see repeating patterns here. So from all perspectives, to target, from target. I'm guessing this is when they're the same and when they're different. So this is, okay. So this is the last one. Yeah, these are kind of all over the place. So I don't know how much we're learning here. I don't know if I want to filter and like delete things off by doing medians and by doing um, like actual filtering of things, or if I want to use means and try to average this in. So I can like, this also doesn't include the path traversal of like going through different nodes to get there. I could look for if that would improve this data, but it might not. Um, so I could do like random traversals. So we'll do, we'll try that. We'll try, um, yeah, we'll try that. Struct RNG seed use size, uh, ample RNG. I know where it's like tabbed in. We're going to just do this. Impl RNG, F and new, self, RNG. We don't even need that to be labeled. Use size, that's gonna be a seed, Python, import random hex, random.random, zero, two to the 64 minus one. That's our seed. F and uh, rand, U size. It's like a mute self, uh, let, we'll just do self dot zero, XOR equals self dot zero, shift 13, 1743, self dot zero, okay. Let mute RNG equals RNG new, and here, what I can do is I can pick a random location to start from. So I can say, so let's go by distances to target from target. I actually want to go back to what I had before where I had them hard coded as these. Okay. And we're going to temporarily comment these out. We'll just scope it like that. Kind of gross, I know. But we're going to be discarding this code when we find out if it works or doesn't work. So, uh, fuck it. We can retype that. From target to target. So, what I want to do is we're going to loop forever. We're going to find the distance between these two things. I'm going to pick a random distance to start at. So, start is equal to distances. Um... Let vowels is equal to distances dot keys dot collect, and this will be the targets. So this will be all possible targets that we have. Did we call them U sixty fours. Yeah, we did. So these are all the different the different targets that we have. I'm going to oops, apparently close the window. Uh, I'm going to then pick a random distance. Uh, rng.rand mod targets.len. So we're going to pick a random place to start. Uh, actually, we'll just call this like next. And then while next, not equal to two targets. My vimrc online anywhere, it's completely default. Uh, it is the default one that you get from uh, user local share vim vimrc example. So. I just set like tab stop to a, a preferred four or, and stuff, but that's that's it. Okay.
While next, uh, let mute distance traveled is equal to zero. So we're going to start off with next is equal to this. And so that's going to pick a random place to start from. And then from that location, we want to go... Do we just always want to start? No, because we want to be able to have a different perspective. So the very first one, I think, is going to be special. The very first traversal, because we want to, we want to start from someone else's perspective. So we're going to start... Um, this will be perspective. Pick a target that we'll use as the origin perspective. And then what we're going to do is we can now get that. We can get the distances there. Um, and we can do let So we have the perspective. We're starting. And then I need to get the uh, urge, uh, the like purse, the perspective dist, which is going to be the distance from that actual perspective. So this is going to be uh, distances perspective of from target. So this is going to be uh, to from distance. This perspective is from the from target. So, okay. Print picked perspective x distance is this perspective persp to from. Now we're effectively writing a fuzzer. Uh, from target, that's just going to be an ampersand. And collect uh, dot copied. Okay. So from the perspective of a 1,000, which is the starting one, the distance is 0. And then from A, the distance is 924. Perfect. So now we have a distance. Now we have a relative distance that we can add. And now we can get pick the first random target from the perspective. So this is going to be uh, let mute next is equal to distances perspective uh, let target is equal to targets rng.rand mod targets.len. So we've picked the starting point, which is going to be the perspective. We've gotten the distance from the perspective to the from target. And now we're going to, in that perspective, pick a random target in that set uh, that we're going to traverse into. So here we're going to get the distance. Um, here, we'll do distance traveled plus equals. Uh, and I think I might have to handle wrapping ads here. I'm not sure. Do, do, do. Working on my makers. OK. Then we have that perspective. We're going to get the distance from in, in that perspective. We're going to then hop into something. So we're going to go from that perspective to another random target. We're going to add that to the distance. And then here we're going to do distance traveled is plus equals the, and this will be an OI64. Um, distance traveled is equal to to from I think do I want to subtract that from someone else's perspective if something is before that will be a negative number 
but that's fine because we're offset and then we're gonna accumulate these to, okay. We're gonna see what this does. Okay, so pick the perspective or distance from this to 1000 is minus 71. So this is saying at 2000, we want to subtract 71, which we do. We subtract 71 and then we travel somewhere uh, and we travel to a random target. Perfect. Good. Uh, let target is equal to that. And then we just want this while, while next, while the target is not equal to the two targets, then we're going to do, we're basically going to do this logic. I, I effectively want to do while. Um, this is going to be immutable. So we're going to go from there to there. If they match, we're going to break out. Print distance traveled this While the target is not equal to the two target, then we're going to pick a new target, and we're going to travel to it. And then if that's the end, then that's the end. Wow, okay, some of these distances are really weird, so I've got something wrong here, or my conceptual idea here is stupid. Um, like, some of these paths could be really long and accumulate errors, but I would expect the errors would... Uh, go away as much as they would accumulate. If that makes sense, they would kind of like average them out. Um, so pick a random value from a perspective, get a distance. Distance traveled is equal to that. Uh, and then here I'm going to say print perspective is x going to x and then distance traveled uh, perspective is perspective oh yep it's wrong okay cool that's what I thought uh, perspective is good from target I think that's fine this is good we get a new target from there And now we want to update the perspective. After we've updated that, perspective is equal to the target. Still wrong. Shit. Uh, let's add that debugging in there. Okay. Uh, print perspective is X going to X distance is this. Uh, this is perspective. We're going to target distance traveled. Okay, so lead to that. So if we go, if we go directly to 9,000, then it's 901. Is that where we're going to? A. We're going to A. Is A in our data set? Kind of. Ah, ah, is plenty in our data set, actually. Okay. So perspective is that we're here. Going to 5,000. Distance is negative 465. Ooh, I think we don't want to go to our self. If we go to our self, we're subtracting too much. And I think what we'll find, or adding too much. Um, we're in this perspective. We pick a random target. If the target is the same as the perspective, uh, let me target 
is equal to the zero. While, oops. If the target is the same as the perspective, I think we want to ignore it. That would cause that to accumulate. If we kept going into ourself, we'd keep, well, we'd do this once. If we kept going into ourself, it'd be zero, 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 I think. Let me see what we got. Um, distances, perspective, targets. Then we're gonna go into here, right after target and the distance traveled update. And then we'll do uh, panic done. We'll just panic. Just to cause the loop to terminate early. I could also break out of the loop, but you know, you know. Okay, so we're at perspective is 7,000. We're going to 7,000. The distance is zero. Then we're going to 7,000 to 1,000, which it views as going back 691. Then 1,000 to 1,000, which is a zero. A 1,000 to a 3,000, which is a 238. Because all the perspectives are relative. Yep. And then that. Yeah, 3,000 to a 1,000 is negative 238. And 1,000 to 7,000 is 691. Okay, so now we want the total distance. I'm just, I'm not quite sure why this is, why this is like growing so much, but maybe it's fine. Maybe it's correct. Maybe some of these paths just accumulate really bad errors. Okay, so in here, we start out at negative 691. Then we go, we go 7,000 to 7,000, zero delta, we're at 691. We go 7,000 to 1,000, so we go back to 1,000. Whoa. Whoa. Um. Because we're starting at 1,000. We're starting at 1,000, which is the negative 691. And we go from 7,000 to 7,000, that has no effect. We go to 7,000 to 1,000, which is going back to the start. That should be zero. And it added 691 to 691, right? The delta was 691. We subtracted 691. Do I just want to subtract here, though? Do I want to subtract this one off, the initial? Or do I want to subtract subsequent ones? Uh, if I subtract that, that would say it's that far away. Let's see what this does. So this obviously fixes it, because we start at 691 positive, then we get rid of it, and then we go to 1,000 to 3,238, and then we go to 3,000 to 1,000, where we nix that. Okay, that's good. That's good to see. And then we go from 1,000 to 7,000, which was a 691 again. And then we go to 7,000 to A, which will add the extra distance to our total of 915. Okay. Some of these are going to be really long. So 955, 921, 771. Okay. So this one seems like an outlier. And let's see why. Perspective is 8,000 to 9,000. Uh, 8,000 to 9,000 is... Oh, yeah. A, A to 0 is the original line 24. A to 9 is 0. So we do... Whoa. What? 924, then we're at, oh, negative 964 for 9,000 to 2,000, which brings us to minus 40 at 2,000. We go to two to eight, which adds 676. 
Uh, then we go 8 to 1,000, which is basically all the way back, and we're at 130, so we're off by 130. Um, and then we go from 1,000 to 9,000, which is 901, which is 771. I think this is actually working. Now, the question is, is it, is it producing anything of value? So now we just want to run it a little bit longer. So I'm going to zoom it out a bit, get rid of some of this debug stuff. But it looks, it looks like it's traversing correctly. Um, and it's just basically doing random traversals throughout this graph. Uh, so like, let's see this one. 3,000 traversed into itself a couple times. And then it went from 4,000 to 5,000. But they're all, they're surprisingly close. Remember, these are traversals. So I guess we will see like pretty extreme values in here. All right. And they're stopping once they get to A, which is the end, and they accumulate that, and that should be good. So this is all of the data that we're getting. It is, wow. Okay. Okay. Now, let meet buckets is equal to OU64 2000. Buckets distance traveled plus equals one. How fast do you think this code is in terms of generating this stuff? Uh, this is as you size. Assert distance traveled is greater than zero. Uh, four attempts in zero I64 or zero U64. Uh, if attempts and uh, uh, is equal to zero, print attempts Okay, that's doing a lot So now what I can do is I can just say We'll stop after 10 million. So we're gonna do 10 million random graph traversals Accumulating the frequencies. And we could we could maybe optimize some of this stuff as well. Uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, actually, we can do like 30 million. Might as well. So we're, we're doing a lot of computation here. And then we'll plot, uh, we'll dump a histogram. For bucket ID... Uh, and then the, so the bucket ID and the frequency in buckets dot iter dot enumerate. If frequency is equal to zero, eh, fuck it. Print five, 10, 10 ID freak. Okay, so now we, we're in some like weird dimension right now, but we're uh, we're effectively looking at the the agreed upon distance between these two locations in cycles, based on all observers' perspectives and paths between them. Oh god, this data is gonna be ass. This is this probably isn't gonna work as 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 I hoped. We'll see. Okay, that's actually really cool. Well, that peak is outrageous. Holy shit. I mean, this is just like really wide though.
it is interesting that like some of those traversals ended up at like 400 and some at like 1400. It's an interesting distribution. It's log scale, remember. But yeah, the um the distribution is the non-log scale distribution. I'm pretty sure that just means yeah, it's like a These peaks, I bet there are 10 of these peaks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe a couple in there. I think these are a constructive interference in the graph traversal. Like these, this peak right here, this crazy peak is probably when we traverse into like something that reinforces this very heavily. Now, is that a sign that this is the one true value? Uh, let's go to 800 by to 900 here. Oops. Uh, to 1,000? Like, that peak is so strong. But I don't... But I would expect... These spikes uh, lead me to believe that this is not good. Because why why would it think that there's something here? I mean, this this is the, the like outlier at exactly nine nine hundred twenty three. Nine hundred twenty three. But the confidence. Like, that is a cool distribution, I will say. It's a very interesting distribution. Um, I mean, we have like one point that really stands out a lot. So what if I do it between two other points? So let's look at Elite 4000 and Elite 5000. See if we get a similar shape. Okay, distance traveled, negative. Um, I'll just do this for now. It's not, it's not ideal. We can figure out better things to do with that data, but I'm just trying to look at general shapes. I'm trying to see if other ones have peaks as well, because maybe the peaks, while absolutely the peaks might not have meaning, oh, that yes, has a similar shape. And this, once again, has one that really does kind of stand out. <sighs> Non-log scale. It's like... It's still, it's the same, it's the same peak, 1.6 times 10 to the 6th. It looks like the other just translated. I, I know, and it's, like, that means that either we filtered out so much noise that it's good, or we're, like, reinforcing some noise and getting the same peak every time. Let's, let's try it with, uh... 2,000 to six to 7,000. I typoed it so it's not even biased. <laughs> That's how science works. <laughs> Same thing. 
do I just pick the the peak? But like, how? This peak is only like. 60 70 percent more significant than this one like is there any reason to believe that this peak actually is better than this like because if this peak is correct this is a it's a difference in like a decent amount of cycles now the question is if the maximum peak is like if this 1.6 times 10 to, the, 10 to the 6, which we see, we've seen this in all of them so far. So let's go, let's go 7,000 to 8,000. Now, there's a chance that that peak is... Is it just the frequency of which I can do a traversal of a certain thing? So yeah, this one is saying, ooh, what was the one that they thought they were on top of each other? It was uh, 9,000 to A, I think, right? Yeah, 9,000 to A. 9,000 to A, it believed that they were right on top of each other. And I'm going to, I'm gonna support negatives. I'm going to support negatives by taking and adding a thousand. Nine to A. We're going to assert distance traveled is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, distance traveled plus equals 1,000. We're just going to translate it to a thousand. So that's now the origin and. Uh, I might need to go larger on this then for the buckets. We'll say if frequency is greater than or equal to zero, if greater than zero, then we'll print it. Then we'll add the uh, const translation u size is uh, let's say let's say five thousand, and then we'll, we'll make this ten thousand. Put it in a vector so it's on the heap. This will then add the translation and then here we'll subtract off the translation uh, yep mm-hmm mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and same on this one Oh, am I supposed to do this one? Oh, that one's fine. This one is not, because it's enumerate. Uh, math. My concern is whether it's actual confidence. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it is or not. Um, so this is the one. Wow, does it really go down to negative 800? Wow. So this has a similar peak at 1.6. Now the peak is at a different location in this graph, which is strange. I mean, there's one peak here. And the fact that there is a peak here concerns me. Because this peak is so far away that I... <sighs> Say if freak is, is greater than 100,000, just to kind of filter these buckets out a bit. Just so this will zoom in on that x-axis so we can see a little bit more of the information. If you have to convert it to an I-64 every time, why would it be a U-size? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Okay, so now we're only looking at the points where it is greater than 1,000, and we have this one peak that is clearly at zero. And that peak, I guarantee you, is the one hop distance.
That is the... That is the distance, and I bet we'll see that with all of them. Um, I, th yeah, I think I'm going to e print. Distances. So we're going to go one to a, that's the full, full jump. Uh, let me pretty print this. So one to a, that's the full jump. Okay. So we know one to a is 920. Uh, 924. What I suspect is that the crazy nutty 1 million peak is going to be exactly 924, and it is. Um, and I think that has to do with the uh, chance that we go one deep. So if we pick and we just do the distance directly across, that's what we're seeing there. The frequency that we see that value um, is the direct relative thing that that peak is the convolution between the from and the two it's it's if we pick the from as the origin and then we go directly from the from to the two because that's a very p frequent thing that will happen it's like a uh, uh, just based on the sampling that we're doing here it, it's very frequent that we'll see that occur um, so I think that is overwhelming the frequencies for that. Um, now, is that good? So I could do a volume-weighted average over all of these buckets to figure out the like distribution of these, although the distribution is very strange. Um, we might just be seeing the distribution of the random number generator itself, if that makes sense. Hmm. Did this data help us? Did we... Because if I did a median, it would just be that location, I think. It'd just be 924. Time to slap it on Kaggle and get other people to do the work. Yeah. I, I mean, like, I... What I'm looking is for something that dramatically gets rid of the noise here. Now, the distance between this blue line, so that blue line, this is our current, current best thing, is just the mean. And it works great, and it's simple. Uh, 186 to the green one, which is A. This is saying 1108. That's saying they're 922 apart based on the means. And this data, if I go by the peak, is saying that they're 924 apart. And that's that's actually the exact same as just the direct convolution, which which was the goal of tonight. Like the the doing the sliding convolutions from one to another, uh, I think works out really well. Um But, like, if I do the convolution between purple and, uh, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm looking for, like, a census. I want all of them to, like, contribute to a census. What if I require a certain level of traversal? If I require that it went through at least X amount of unique nodes. And that would get rid of the 
bias towards what's the easiest path or the most common path to randomly sample uh, because I don't want I don't that's what we're seeing right now we're seeing the most common path that gets randomly sampled to show up as these peaks which sucks so what I could do is uh, I think I understand what you're doing are you familiar with this graph so this graph is basically showing me uh, frequencies of observed values that were leaked through an exploit on an Intel processor. And what I'm trying to do is go from these, which as a human I can look at this and say that purple was first, and then this was second, and this was third, and this was fourth, and this was fifth, and this was sixth, and seventh, and eighth, and so on and so forth. I would prefer for the computer to spit out this value was accessed at this cycle, and this value was accessed at this cycle. And what that means is that this like 100 cycle range here, this 200 cycle range where this value was accessed, I need for that to no longer be a range, but a concrete value. I need to agree, they, they're basic, I'm doing like edge triggering uh, effectively, and that's why I went with convolutions. I'm trying to find how to sync all of these up together such that I can put lines. I don't care absolutely where the lines are. I only care relatively where the lines are. But I want it to put the line through the same relative location in each of these samples. So let me look for 1,000 to 2,000. So 1,000 to 2,000 is interesting because almost the entirety of data for 2,000 is contained inside of the blob of 1,000. So they're very close. So let me see. Let me look for 1,000 to 2,000. Effectively, I'm trying to eliminate noise. And the reason I think there's noise in the sampling mechanism is because these graphs have the same shapes where it's like a peak, and then like ripple, ripple, peak, ripple, ripple, peak, ripple, ripple. Uh, so I'm using basically these, these um, uh, convolutions to try to eliminate some of those ripple rippers and just get these peaks. And now what I'm looking at, so I have that data, and I actually haven't done anything with that yet. I think that's going to be really good. Uh, but now what I'm doing is I'm looking at all of the different ways that I can... So, like, from the perspective of purple, purple is X amount of distance from this, like, end point. But also, from the perspective of, uh, of this one, it has a certain distance from purple and a certain distance from this, and thus if it combines those together, that might be different than what purple thinks from directly, let's say, purple to red. Uh, so what I'm trying to do is kind of get a community vote on, like, yellow says, well, I see purple is this away from me, and red is this away from me, and this one thinks this and this are the distances, and so on and so forth, and try to build up that, that knowledge, if that, if that makes any sense. Because it, it doesn't quite make sense to me yet, but we'll, we'll figure, we'll figure it out. Okay, so we start in a random perspective, we then go, we figure out how far we are from that perspective to the from target. So the, the algorithm that we implemented here, basically, it'll pick a random place. So we're, we're telling it, specifically, I'm going to go from 1,000 to 2,000. So what it's doing is it, it is picking a random data set. So let's say it picks yellow. It has picked yellow. It will then figure out how far yellow thinks it is from purple. And that will be the first calculation, this distance traveled. We'll subtract that off. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick from that perspective a random point. So we're, gonna, we're in yellow, we have this distance, and now yellow is going to pick a random spot to go to on the graph. So let's say it picks to go to blue. It will then add that distance to the distance traveled, and then let's say blue finalizes it by going to red, which let's say is our, our two target, in which case that traversal will get added on, and then we'll see the distance between this and this. So it'll go from yellow, uh, yellow to purple is implied, it'll traverse into blue, which will then traverse into red, that will finalize it, and I'm hoping the goal of this was that by doing these random traversals that the average would eventually kind of come out. That 
that the differences, the little bit of jitter and noise between where everyone thinks everything is would be rooted in a ground truth of the correct value. Now, it's very likely that we're just looking for noise in noise, but what I'm looking for is like a really well-defined peak that is showing like this is what everyone agrees is the right value. Now, the problem is right now we've biased it. Uh, we've biased it to go with the easiest path traversal. So what I need to do is I need to unbias it by um, requiring a certain level of traversing. Uh, and I can do that with a couple different algorithms. I can either just keep track of the traversals that were made. Um, I think self-to-self -self things are fine. Okay, so for a certain spot in time, you're looking for an attribution to a cycle. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I think I want to prevent things from traversing... What if I just prevent them from ever traversing back into themselves? So we're going to start off with all of them are traversable. I'm going to then remove... Uh, oops. Let's see if that's safe. I think it is, yeah. Uh, then here we're going to do the same thing. This will prevent them from traversing in a cyclic way. Although, I'm, do I want that? Do I want the cyclical traversals? I'm not sure if I do that. Uh, I, I We're just going to try it. Reminds me of a current neural network. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's similar to that. I don't know if it actually is or not. But we're doing some weird shit here. Um... Oops, tr trab. Oops. Uh, remove. I didn't save it. Okay. Uh, yep. Div by zero. Uh, that's just gonna happen if this runs out. So we'll say, uh, if that len is equal to zero. Uh, abandon. Oops. This might take a lot longer for the data com to come through. I'm going to get rid of this frequency requirement, and uh, we'll drop that down to a million. See how long this takes. Okay, that was actually really fast, so we'll go to 10 million. Okay, that's looking better. It's actually doing some crunching. That looks the same as the issue we had before. Although, we still have these peaks. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight peaks. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten things. I think it's still, this is still going to bias. Um, here's what I want to do. This will tell me the remaining number 
of, well, you print it. This will tell me the remaining number of things to traverse. And what I could say is, I want the traverse to end when all of the all of the paths have been taken. So we've like traversed, we've used up all the things. So if dot len is equal to zero, if and only then, we will actually bucket it. So this will require that it traverses through all nodes to get there. That looks better. That looks a lot better. Um, let's just, uh, how many data points are that? Uh, like 8,000? What I could use is, uh, I could use a, um, not a Fisher Yates shuffle. Uh, the other shuffle to shuffle them and make sure that I still have like a path to traverse between them. Sup, how's it going? I mean, this data looks a lot better, right? It still looks a little fuzzy and bumpy, but I think that is within the noise. This looks like a normal curve to me. This looks very normal, uh, which I like. So let's just up this to 100,000. <laughs> it looks very normal. Now, we might just be seeing the normal, normal sampling of uh, basically the traversals that we're performing. But yeah, we, we've basically, we're now discarding a lot of our data, which is hurting us. Uh, we're just throwing a lot of data in the trash, which kind of sucks. Um, we're doing a clone here, so that's like a... a... Okay. So now we have a peak at a slightly different point. I, I think it's safe to say that this this peak is uh, within like the fluke of this, where where I think if I were to change that random seed, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna keep that graph open. I'm gonna change my random seed by changing that to a four. And then we're gonna see if we see a different spike. And if we do, then then I think um, that spike is is not due to the way we're traversing. It's not a flaw. Uh, this is actually a really good thing that we could have done the very first time we ran into this issue. Uh, we could have um, we could have changed the seed and then see seen if we had the same peaks. Have to run, but this is in interesting. See you around, Lord Dankington. Hope you had fun. I'll upload the vod to YouTube. Oh, interesting. That peak looks to be in kind of the same spot. Wow, they do have a very similar shape. Whoa, that's weird. There's like one spike here. There's one spike here. There's like this primary spike kind of right biased. We have a flat point here. Oh, that's weird. It's cool. Now, all that really matters is that we can just do a normal and draw a mean line through here, and then the mean line is what we'd use as the the value. Um, this is Intel leak data, yes. So let's take a look at uh, 1,000 and 9,000, see how that data goes, and I don't think we need a, a 100 million. I don't think that's really helping us too much. Okay, so this is a different one. Um, I feel like I can draw. So this is the distance between 1,000 and 9,000. And if we look at the raw data, the distance between 1,000 and 9,000. So I would say, as a human... It's very difficult for me to say the distance between 1,000 and 9,000. I would actually probably pick one of these values. I would pick like where it's kind of straight because this, I can't, I don't know where to pick. I don't see an edge here. There's no edge. So I'm going to go by this at like a th uh, this 200 mark. So this is at 955. 
actually 956, not that it really matters because we're hovering over it, down to here, which we're going to say is 64. So this is saying they're 892 apart, these two. That would be my human guess. This one is saying they are 934 apart. And I think the reason for that is it's accounting for some of the some more of the mass of this this structure. Oh, I'm seeing something now that I should have seen earlier. I'm going to hmm. I actually think I've maybe been going down the wrong path. So I think what we're going to end up doing is what I talked about very early on, and it's using the minimums, the, the earliest I've seen certain things observed. Um, and the reason for that is if we look at the means between these the red and the black, this is saying that like red, red and black are happening, uh, that's 921 minus 894. So like, let's say 25 cycles apart. But if we look at when they first like peak on the data, red crosses 200 here and black crosses 200 here. And if we look at that, that's 849 minus 738. I'm actually kind of off with my cursor. 741. That is 108. And the distance between these like early minimums is much more accurate to our actual, because we know, we put a, about a 100 cycle delay between those down, uh, down here. We, we put a 100 cycle delay between them. Now, what I would want for any data, for any processing of the data to make me happy is I would want to see basically 100 between them. And I would say if I went by when they cross 200, we've got a 65 followed by a 163, almost to the cycle 100. Then the blue... 299. So that adds a little bit more onto it, but it's still close. Then I have a 410 from a 292, close. Then a 519, close. So these are all kind of 100 apart. But when you look at the centers of mass, they aren't 100 apart because they get clustered in these because the, the previous value persists for too long. Right? Because... What we're seeing is, as I mentioned before, uh, the processor, there are two different values that we can leak at a given time. And so when you see that one value, when one value disappears, it gets replaced by another effectively in the two different load ports that there are. Uh, so I would suspect that what, what we're effectively seeing here is, and, and if this is the only conclusion I get from the night, is that Obviously, I'm looking into the two different load ports, these, these different peak structures. And then the reasons these persist long enough is the load port doesn't get evicted until this next load occurs, I think. I think that's what I'm seeing. So I'm sampling one load port here. It's still in this load port for a long time. Um, and then it finally starts to get replaced with this one. And I think what I want to do is I actually want to look at more of like the initial times the minimum time that I observe a value. I mean, that that might, as I mentioned very early on in the stream, that the first data point that I get for each one might be the best thing that I can get. Now, the shape, the shapes of these, these things, I do think are accurate. I'm trying to figure out what cycle something was loaded on, but the data that I'm seeing here is the cycles that that loaded value was the most recently loaded thing which is technically more correct to the processor, right? That is the data that I'm truly interested in. Like, I am interested in how long does this value survive on the load port, and how long does this value survive on the load port. And I think it's really cool that I actually have that information. But the, the value... The value is like only loaded onto the load port once, right? So what we're seeing is the frequency of observation of that value go up. So like when we're seeing this kind of taper here, I'm curious if there's actually a pattern of these getting softer and softer over time. 
um, if I were to go deeper. So I'm going to run a, a new test on that. So we're going to go uh, 16 deep, 100 cycles. Um, we're going to up our sample. We'll go to 2,500 as our sample period. Hopefully this is enough data. We might need to collect for 60 seconds for this run because it's a, a, a wide one. Uh, I closed that other terminal. I actually moved it. Python runner and Python parse load sequence. So here we'll collect the new data. We'll be able to zoom out and see a little bit wider. I'm curious if those patterns repeat. But yeah, I do think we're just probably, after all of this work, uh, we're probably just going to, I think this is a 60 second run. Cool. Um, I think even after all of this work, we're probably just going to go by the initial, uh, the earliest we ever saw the value observed, uh, because this is going to give us center of mass. Um, actually, this is going to give us the distance between things. This actually might be correct. Uh, is it? So this is between 1,000 and 2,000. We're going to wait for this data to come in. This is saying they're peaked about 50 cycles apart. Now those have different shapes, so I don't think that's as fair. I think 1,000 to 3,000, I think this might be a lot more fair. Because these have the same shape. This is saying 1,000 to 3,000 are about 238 apart. Uh, divide that by two, about 110 each. Um, Let's go to 8,000. New data is coming in. We're about to have all the data as well, I think. Uh, let me check what we have. Uh, yeah, we've got eight. We've got one through eight inclusive, which is what I think I put in my data set. Zero through eight, but it will ignore the first one. Uh, looks good, and then I can copy those once they're done processing. So all the 133s, we're going to copy over, replace our, our data set with this new collection that we just did. That's our new data. There we go. And let's see. Uh, we got a couple of these open. Oops. Well, CD, sushi roll, CPU graphing, Python, parse, load sequence. Okay, so they, interesting. They have actually slightly different shapes from the last time we sampled. Um, I think I capped that to, we want to go out to 2,500. In this case, which is our full sample range. Wow. <coughs> I called it with a 2,500. Whoops. There we go. Okay. Got to use some mana quick. Okay, so they do kind of get more triangular over time. Um, they look really good. Now, the means, the means that we were graphing before, the first time we ever graphed this data and we, and we went with these normal distributions, I think they're bad. Uh, because the distance between this and this is a lot greater than the distance between these two means and centers of mass. Um, now, it does look like they correctly are predicting the ordering. Actually, in this case, this is a really interesting one. We have the green and this like pink or whatever color this is in, in the diamonds. Uh, they overlap almost directly in the, um, in the means, but the green... Oh, this is actually interesting. Uh, this one's showing that green happened prior 
to this diamond. But if we looked, the diamond clearly happens before green, right? The, the first diamonds we see, if, if we're looking at just the legs of the graph, these like left legs, it's clearly uh, uh, these pluses, squares, squares, um, we see these, like, right, we see these basically spaced evenly across the data set. Very evenly spaced. But when we look at the overall, the means, the centers of mass, uh, we see that there's, like, massive overlap here, and this is incorrect, right? This is an incorrect prediction here. So if I used this algorithm, this, this mean, uh, this would be really bad because I would now think that this load occurred prior to this one, which is not true. Um, so looking at the first occurrences, like I said earlier, uh, when you're working with the processor, the processor has a lot of noise of when things can occur, but there's only one earliest occurrence. It, it, you can't have noise on the earliest you've ever observed because you can't, you can't have a random chance that the processor goes faster than it's capable of running, if that makes sense. And thus, if we were to look at this data and sequence it based on the first time we observed values, uh, we would indeed find the exact correct sequence. So now the question is, does our new logic help at all with that? Um, because picking the first one, there's still some iffiness uh, when things are more tightly compacted. So let's take a look here. And I want to do, what do I want to do here? I want to look at, uh, okay, so we've got our data. And what were the interesting ones? These two, green and uh, this is like green dot and purple diamond, 9,000 to 8,000. 9,000 to 8,000. Make sure we have the right data set. We do. Okay, so this is going to try and tell me the distance between those two based on the convolutions of, of all the traversals of the graph. And this is saying that this is just telling us the mean. That's all it's doing. Is saying it's negative 44. It says that 9,000 happens prior to 8,000, which is not true. So I don't think I don't think this is going to work. Um, and the, and the main reason why this logic is not going to work is because we're looking at things that are expired and and hanging out on that bus. Um, and what we really want to be doing is looking at the first time that that we see them. So. I mean, that, that was still really fun to go through there, and I, I still think that's really effective for kind of comparing some of these different shapes with each other, uh, but it's definitely not going to be the correct model to use. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to print the earliest time that each value was observed. God, this data looks so cool. I kind of don't want to clean it up because it looks so cool. Um... So I could set like an arbitrary threshold of the first frequency where I saw 10. I don't think that's too unfair to any of these. So I'm going to go into my actual the Python graphing script. When I go to draw the mean lines, I'm going to actually make a new one. And this one's going to be draw thresholds. Uh... And what this is going to do is this is going to uh, draw a line at the first point where threshold was uh, exceeded in frequency. So here we'll do threshold is equal to, uh, we'll do 10. So we're going to go through all of the values. Oh, that's the... We might not have the data that we want right now. Delay, uh, parser find all, if leet not in them, values of interest, go through, append them to a list. Um, 
value append the delay. I think I can do min on that. numpy.min data. Value that min. So this is the 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 minimum, the the complete minimum. Um, so thirty, one thirty two, one seventy four. Ooh, one twelve. Really. What is this data? All vowels append delay. These are going to be for the frequencies. Yeah, these should just be the delays. If we look, it's, yeah. So these are the sorted delays that we've seen for each different value. So that truly is the minimum. So going by the minimum, this is telling me that uh, there is 4,000 was seen before 3,000 and 5,000 was seen before 4,000. Um, and then they seem to follow a decent trend. Isn't that ambiguity in the mean just reflecting the fact that some things are reordered? Um, no, in this case, uh, the ambiguity is more that th certain values live longer as stale values in the load ports which means that they bias the mean to the right. So for example, if you were to load a value and it's in a load port and thus that's what we're leaking and it stays in there for an hour, we're going to sample that value for an hour and the mean will be 30 minutes. And the issue is that the value was loaded one second in but it survived in that like, let's say cache, right? Uh, it survived in that cache for long and and when we're looking at means and we're looking at normal distributions we're ignoring the fact that the value is only loaded once it only exists once but it can hang around for a longer time and that's the issue that we're seeing with the like flat tops on some of these uh graphs is like the value wasn't loaded all of these different times we're not sampling it being loaded here we're sampling it have having been loaded very early on and then persisting and then going away um so okay so right now i'm I, I see the minimum value but i want to go by what i can do is i can say if frequency is less than threshold if the frequency is less than threshold then we're going to ignore it from our data set entirely. Wow, I can't spell. Threshold. If it's less than threshold, then we'll... Uh, oh, if it's greater than or equal to threshold, then we'll add it. And now this will be the minimum of the threshold. And these are now in order correctly. So we got 56, 159, 254, 376... 475, 623, 700, 840, 928. They're all uh, pretty much exactly 100 apart. I mean, there's noise in there, but, but that's that's to be expected. I could set the threshold lower. Um, that didn't have, honestly, a huge effect. What if I go higher? The higher the threshold, the more confidence that I know the value was loaded by that point in time. So this looks a lot better. And I don't know if I can do 100. I cannot. 20? I'm happy with that. I would have had to have seen the value leak 20 times for that cycle count. Um which is not really going to happen until it's kind of like definitely been observed. I could see flukes on the like one or five. So I think I drew in those lines. So the lines that you see now, the lines through the graph are where we 
are confident that that value has been loaded, and they look much more evenly spaced apart than these peaks, right? And I'm happy with that. They're they're very well spaced apart, um, and they're correctly in order. Yellow, teal, yeah. This is this is a hundred percent correct. There's no inaccuracies here. So let's see how it fares when we drop the uh, frequency down. So we're gonna drop this delay. We're gonna drop it to a delay of five. So they're only gonna be five apart. Now due to the fact that there's a loop there, I don't know if the processor will be able to speculate past that point. Uh, we did build it. Yeah. Okay. So now we're gonna see how close these are together. We learned so much tonight. We, we definitely know that we're sampling the two separate load ports and now we can attribute different loads to different load ports, which is incredible. I did not think that was ever gonna be something I was gonna have the capability of doing is knowing which loads were dispatched by which load ports. Um, I, I'm pretty blown away by that actually, that, that that's now a thing that I have access to. So that's exciting. <laughs> We're gonna see what this data looks like. We're gonna see if this is correct and in order. They should all be about five apart. <laughs> Technically, they should be about 10 apart because the, the latency of the load is four cycles, so they should be nine apart. Um, but Now these axes might be too close to each other for for me to determine when they actually occurred. Although at this point it they might actually happen out of order. Well, they can't because they're dependent. I mean, they might because they could be predicted. It's weird. It's weird to have confidence in this data when it's so just randomish. We're waiting for that to come through. Serial port's slow. There we go. Yep, everything's much more compressed. 63 to 69 to 77 to 84 to 90 to 97, 102, 107, 104, 120, 127. This looks fantastic. They're all in order. It's exactly what I expected. So I can, uh, what was my sampling at? When did the graph end? Uh, we can stop at like 300. So we're gonna sample the same amount of time, but in a smaller window. So we're gonna get a lot more accuracy on our data. So we're gonna sample to 300. And then down here, I'm gonna get rid of this loop entirely. We're just gonna do the dependent loads now. So now we have just the dependent loads. We're gonna get this, uh, so I'm gonna close this down because uh, that didn't work out for us. That's fine, that's science. Now that data that we collected, the, the convolutions that we did are, are probably relevant to figuring out how long things survive, which is an interesting piece of information that we might want to collect, um, but it's not necessarily the information that we're looking for right now, which is sequencing and, and observing these loads. So we'll take a look. It turns out the approach is, is kind of what I theorized early on, is that just, just snapping uh, based on a, a, an early, um, like one of the earliest occurrences of some level of confidence of like that 10. Um, And I could make it more specific. I could try, I could find like the, um, hmm. I could cope by like cumulative running through the frequency and like adding up. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I think by the time it hits 10, it's pretty good. I'm trying to think of like a good way to do edge detection on the front. Be, because there might be like data point, data point, skip data point. Um, and I'd like to find a way to find the first data point. I could maybe cut off the first uh, certain amounts. 
uh, parse load sequence dot pi. We'll switch this to um, We'll just let it find the own the the ending there. And put it in floating so it doesn't get smushed. Okay. So 46, 53, 64, 66, that's close. 74, 77, 82. These are all in order and exactly as I expected. And they're all evenly spaced when we look at the graph. Um and when we look at the the means these mean values that we're seeing. Now we're actually seeing some of these sampled really low. Um, that's interesting. So like, here's where we think purple happened. And here is, here is the like purple mean. Oh, I guess, yeah, it's just very early on there. Um, 2000, we have a lot of data here. This looks pretty good. Now, I think I might be biasing some of these to be closer to each other because I'm not going by relative to their peaks. Since I have that arbitrary threshold, actually, all of these have relatively similar peaks. So this is the point where I maybe would want to normalize it such that I'm not... Um, since I, since I'm using a constant threshold, a fixed absolute threshold on values that have different peaks that could cause to me, uh, that could cause me to end up like snapping or like building up that confidence, uh, more based on how relatively tall the peak is because like this one that has a taller peak than this red one, likely this red one will take longer to get to that 10 threshold or whatever we set, the 20 threshold that we set. And that kind of biases the data to saying that this happened later and this happened sooner, which if we look at black and red, uh, which are here, um, they actually look really well spaced. So I, I guess that's kind of the hard part, is like trying to determine how, how do I figure out the first time things come online. Now, I could go by a larger value, since these are sampled so hot compared to, although these are like, the red ones are kind of all over the place here. I'm going to go into um, log scale so I can see some of the uh, lower frequency things, or the... Okay, so we've got blue, purple, orange down here, green, yellow, red, black. Okay, good. That looks good. Now, blue hits this 10 threshold very early on, then gets to this 100, then dips down, then shoots over 100. So I think, like, if I did 200, actually, if I did, like, they all cross this point this 1,000. So I'm going to try a threshold of 1,000. And this... Oh, they're still clumped together and like... I'm just looking for them to be not as clumped. I would, I would expect them to be basically always four apart. Four or five apart. And we are actually seeing that. Uh, some are nine apart. This one's 11 apart. But that might be real delay? I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I don't... I, there might just be too much noise in the sampling and collection of this data for me to have confidence in... I, I can derive the ordering of the loads from this information. I, I, I truly believe that I have that capability. But I don't know if I can tell specifically when the loads occurred, but I don't think that matters too much. I, I would love to have that because it's better. If I would know exactly when a load occurred, that's better than than knowing just the order they occurred in because one is a superset of the other. Uh, I probably know within a couple cycles of when loads occurred. That's probably the conclusion. 
Let me drop the threshold down. Let me go down to one. And there are errors at one. And I am not surprised to see that. Five. There's an error here at five. At 20. No errors at 20. But close. And at a thousand. So they do seem to kind of spread out and take, take better shape uh, as I up that threshold. And... Yeah, a thousand's about as high as I would go. Um, but they definitely all cross through that. I don't know a better way of determining when they start, when these when these spike. Uh, maybe there's a really good way of detecting that. But at least I have the ordering here accurately. And let's... Uh, Let's up this to, let's up that to 64. I don't know what that goes to, so let's just label them up to F. We'll do more loads and then we'll space, uh, we'll go to, instead of 300, we'll go to 800 here. And in this one, we have that auto fitting on the, okay. So let's see how this comes in. Oops. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a thing. Um, I might be smashing over stuff by doing that. How many, there's 16 per going up to F. That should be fine. I mean, I'm just picking like random addresses that might not uh, might not be valid memory. Let's go to four. Yeah, that'll probably not be used by the kernel. Mm-hmm. Oops, still an issue. Faulting on a oh, uh, because we're writing in this null. That's the issue. Okay. Well, it doesn't hurt that we're using higher addresses. And I just need to change this. I think I have a 133. This is now 433. Okay. So we'll let this data come in. Now we see a lot more things. Makes sense. And I expect to see about 64 loads. All in order. Hopefully. But yeah, this is uh, this is weird, weird stuff. Hmm, I'm trying to think of other ways I could sample the data to reduce that noise. I don't think there is. I don't know. I mean, I'm happy. I I want to say I'm happy with this, but I, I always want better. <laughs> Whenever I get something like two months ago, two weeks ago, I would be happy with where I am right now. I'd be like, holy shit, I can't believe I have that much data and that much sequenced and I know the order and I'm looking at hidden loads that are happening during speculation on the processor. But, you know, I kind of always want the like holy grail of knowing exactly to the cycle. But I just don't think, I don't think I have, due to the fact that I have to randomly sample these load ports, I don't think I'll be able to get below five cycles of resolution. Although I might be there. I might be really close to that. We might have to change this threshold as the data comes in. The, the peaks are going to be a lot lower, so if we have a thousand as the threshold still, it's going to be bad. Oops. Um. Hmm. I mean, still did fun things and learned shit. <laughs> uh, NumPy. Zero size array reduction. 
Yep, that is a threshold issue. So we'll go to a threshold of one temporarily, which is going to be wrong. And then we're, oh. And here we go. Okay, looks good. And all I want to do is figure out what they're crossing over. It looks like they're all probably crossing the 100 marker. I'm going to set a threshold to 30. All right. Are these numbers in order? I guess it's more... These are in order. The question is, are these in order? And so far, I haven't seen any go back in time. I don't see any. I think those are all sequenced. 71, 78, 80. Yeah. I don't see any of these numbers go backwards in time. So that... That simple filter worked a treat, and now I know the order those occurred in. So I'm gonna take I'm gonna take a like 15 minute, uh, probably not 15 minute break. I'm gonna take like a five minute break, bio break. I'm gonna get some dinner started and thrown in the oven, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to. randomly pick the sequence of these loads to perform basically generate a random list and then i am going to as a consumer of the data predict the order the axis has occurred in and then we're going to see if it matches to reality so we'll basically blindly use a seed to generate to randomly shuffle a list and then that shuffled list will just traverse and then we'll print out that list to like some some data that won't show up on screen so we won't know we won't know the order that was picked and then we'll try to deduce the order and then we'll see if we are correct that sound cool i think that will be a, a good way to show whether or not we were were able to sequence these loads with confidence so It'll be like blind, blind trying to figure it out. So I'll be, I'll be back in uh, a few minutes here.
All right. So, how many loads should we try to determine the order of? I think we could do like 128. Let's go, let's shoot for that. So this, from this to range seven, plus 128 times 4,096. That'll give us a, uh, yeah. So I have 128 different things that will then put addresses of themselves in. So we're gonna write the address of themselves uh, to that location. And then, do to do, do. So we'll go through all these addresses. We're gonna write the address of themselves to the location, and then I need to do a uh, that one shuffle that I was talking about earlier. Uh, not a Fisher Yates. I think it's just uh, the Wikipedia mentions the other one. It, Marsal, Marsal, Ah, Satolos. Okay, Satolos. That's what I need to implement. Um, I'm just going to get the number of items. While I is greater than 1, I am minus minus. So I'm going to go through... Uh, I is equal to the length. We're going to pre-index, subtract it. I think that's rand range less than or equal to i minus one, so inclusive. Oh, inclusive to i minus one. So basically, I just want to go and, <clears throat> I think I just want to pick a random item for the end <clears throat> and swap with it. So I go to the end of the array, I swap a randomly picked element from prior in the array, swap into that place. I, I think that's literally it, right? Start at length, random range, zero to I minus one, so not ourself, of course, and we just swap with it. That's that's what the algorithm is. Okay, so we're gonna go uh, unsafe. Um, uh, let's see. So const. Bins, use size 128 bins. So we're going to start. Let mute ii is equal to, or actually we can just do uh, 4 ii in 0 dot dot bins dot reverse. Then I will do a core pointer read of, uh, let's do const base u size equals that base. Okay, so we're going to read from base plus ii times 4096 as a mute i size. Uh, is there a pointer swap, actually? There might be a swap that we'll do in place. Swap. Swaps two things pointed to, perfect. So we'll do a core pointer swap between base and a randomly picked location, base plus, uh, I need an RNG. B split will give me an RNG. Uh, B split dot RNG dot rand mod I I. And we don't want to go down to zero, of course. Times 4096 as mute i size. So 
from the max to the start, going down to one inclusive. We will swap, so that at the end we'll swap one with zero in that case. Okay. Uh... Just do as you size here. You size base, what? Range, fins. Uh, one seventy seven. Val, you size. Okay, I think this will theoretically be correct. Yeah, those are like now stacked messages just so we could get that RNG. Not a big deal. Okay, and actually we only do that once, so I'm, I'm going to do uh, uh, CPU already Rand. Just it, the perf doesn't matter in this case, so I can use already Rand here. What's the significance of the chosen base address? Nothing. Just uh, one I just typed out. Okay, already ran uh, as you size. So we'll swap those two. And now we should have this list, should be traversable. Shouldn't be any crashes, should work just fine. And we should see loads at a bunch of different places, kind of all over the place. So these are going to be sorted, uh, but the sequence of them will be unknown to us until we get to the end. So what I will do is do a traversal. So I'll do 4 and 0 dot dot. We'll do 128. Same here. So I'll have 128 loads. I'm going to do... Mute val is equal to uh, base. Mute u size is equal to base. I don't know. I don't need that strong ass typing here. Okay, so this will now be val is equal to uh, uh, core pointer read val. on safe, and then print val. So these are all the values that will be read during this case. Because we're going to go through, and we only are going to see the contents of the reads, so we don't want to print the value beforehand, because we won't actually see the base in our results. So we'll print the values here, and that's going to be the, the like, secrets. Uh... Expected a pointer. Oh, yep, as you, you size. And lower hex not supported for that. As here, we can just do pointer. Okay, so those look randomly ordered. D4 CD. C583. Okay, so the ordering has changed between them. Um, and then I will just do this for and zero dot fifty print. It'll scroll it off the screen. That's that's gonna be our our that'll make it hidden. <laughs> So this is going to go through. It's going to perform all those accesses. We're now going through. We're trying to figure out which ones were being performed. Uh, actually, I need to run it out deeper, I think. So I did 128. So let's go to uh, 
Let's go to 1500 cycles, make sure we're definitely observing everything that we need to. And then I'm going to up this to make sure that I sample all of those effectively. Okay. Uh, I'm going to clear screen just so I don't have scroll back. And then I'm going to T uh, logged.txt just so I don't lose that information. So it'll take a little bit longer because we're looking up for a million of the any leaks and then we're going to be doing 60 seconds of the binary leaks. Maybe a million was a lot. <laughs> I just want to make sure I don't miss any of the values. So this is trying to figure out what values are being leaked in the first place. Actually, T, T is probably screwing us up here. I've noticed that T will sometimes not flush the, the screen. So I'm guessing that this has actually been running and T is just eating it. Uh, maybe not. Okay, so... We have all those four EE values, or four three three values. It looks like we sampled them plenty, like in the thousands. So I, I don't think we missed any of the values that we could potentially have here because there are things in this data set that we won't know. We don't know all of the values that are being read. So we're gonna try to see if we can figure out exactly what order and what values are being read. And the 60 seconds is probably overkill, but eh, it doesn't take too long to get this data. I'll eventually spin this up and use multiple cores and, and whatever and run different data tests on different cores, but uh, for what I'm looking into, this is pretty smooth sailing. All right, here we go. Just waiting for that data to export. And then I think my Python stuff's going to sort it, maybe. So what the output that we get from Python is going to be basically meaningless. Uh, we're probably going to have to sort that by the minimum value. So we might have to collect that into something else. Yeah, we actually have this. Uh, oh, that's interesting. That's shown that a threshold of 30 is too low. That's That's scary. I mean, there's a chance that, uh, I guess I can go to a threshold of one. Oh, wow. We just don't have 128 might have just been a, a little bit much. Um, let's see how many values we have here. Uh, is that printing exactly just the values? Uh, so we can do unique. What? Oh, WCL. Whoops, my bad. 76. We're only seeing 76 of those values. Oh, whoa, whoa. Is that this? Oh, actually, let me see if the charts, if we're running off the chart. Oh, we are. We're truncating data. 1500 is not long enough. Uh, we're not missing anything at the start, which is good, but we are definitely truncating things at the end. So we're at 76 at 1600. Let's just go to 3000. Uh, cargo run. Looks good. Clear that. And then we'll run this one to log it. And I don't need the, I don't need the million. That's stupid. Okay. So those were our secret values. 
And now this time, hopefully we won't have anything trimmed off. Looks like all those numbers were high enough that I don't think we're missing anything in the hundreds. Not too bad. Uh, wow, we're only getting 2,000 leaks a second right now. Ooh. Ooh. That's interesting. Oh, I guess that makes sense because I'm looking for so many different values. At this point, I should be using the any value leak. I shouldn't actually be using the... I shouldn't be using the binary search thing that I'm doing because I have too many values. At, at like 64, it's just not worth it. Uh, we're actually kind of hurting it, but we're losing about 4x the data we would have in the same amount of time as otherwise, uh, which doesn't... I don't know if that's going to matter or not. So this should hopefully have like a thousand like a thousand data points for each peak. If we're getting 2,500 leaks a second, uh, 60 seconds, yeah. I would expect like a thousand. So we could probably set a threshold of like 20, 50. We'll see what this looks like. I just want to make sure on the tail end of the graph, on the right side of the graph, that there's no data, that it's just kind of flat, empty. Come on, data. Well, it looks clean on that side, so I think we've sampled everything, and it looks like everything crosses... Uh, it looks like everything at least crosses the 10 boundary. So let's look at the 10. I guess we can go to 20 and see if that one works. Okay, 20 was too low, 10. Okay, everything crossed 10. So, yeah, I guess some things didn't make it up to 20. That's gonna be a little concerning. There might be some issues there then. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised. We did see 128 values, so I think we have all the values that we we observe that we wanted to observe, and now we just have to sort them by their minimums. So I'm going to do uh, mins mins is equal to this is going to just be a just an array, and then here we'll do uh, mins dot append the minimum and the value and then min uh, for val for min uh, mu val in mins sorted mins print mu uh, we'll do this minimum 40.16x mod mu val. Okay, so this is the order that it thinks they occurred in, and it looks like it did sort that correctly by those. Okay, so those are sorted. And I'm just going to print just the value. Okay, uh, maybe, dot text, d120, vsp logged, that wasn't what we wanted, oh, since we did and and, we actually lost that information. Because the T didn't take effect on the first one. The T caused, yeah, yep, yeah, that happened on the IC. We did call that logged, right? Yeah. Well, that was stupid. Um, uh, 
Oh, we'll just do this. Uh, T logged dot text, and we'll we'll process it separate. All right, take two. Now, yeah, now I'm having that T thing where it's not printing it. It's it's definitely running. It's doing the printouts. It's just running for the minute right now. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why T does that. Why does T break the, like... Uh, it's weird. Weird. I don't get it. Do 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 do. Come on. I think with one minute we might not have enough data here. Well, one minute with the non any because we're missing out on four x the the sampling. So we're setting a lower threshold, which allows for more noise, more noise. So we'll see what this does. We don't really see the printout until it until it flushes when the application exits. There we go. Load sequence. Uh, D120. We're just going to format this. Uh, actually, the other one is in. What's the other format? Uh, logged. Okay. Apparently there are CRLFs on this one. I'm just going to format this. This, this. Send us. Oh, there's some of this shit too. This RN with just an R. There's 128. That is probably the data. Maybe dot text. And then that one will format uh, parse load sequence. We'll put an OX out front and let it auto adjust the size of it. Okay. Vim diff, maybe. Logged. Identical. And there we go. We were able to predict and sequence, or not predict, but we were able to leak and sequence and know exactly all of the values in their order as the correct values for 128 different loads in order, all inlined with no delay between them. That, my friends, is pretty good data. <laughs> Let's take a look at... Uh... So this is what we were able to process. And yeah, they're all pretty evenly spaced, actually. How fucking cool is that? 
we were able to go through. This was over the course of 2,500 cycles. We were able to leak all of the different values that were read here. They were in a random order that we did not know. We were able to find which order they occurred in and the values that they were over the course of 128 loads, uh, which I guess if we look at uh, 2,500, like the last data point here looks like, I guess that's like uh, 25, 28 minus, let's say, I don't know, 50, 60, 70. 70 is the first. We got like 2450, I rounded, uh, divided by 128. They're all about 19 cycles apart. Huh. Huh. Kind of surprised. 19 cycles apart. I would have expected uh, four. Although, we might be running into TLB issues. Just because uh, we're doing so many loads and these are all on different pages. But that's actually really cool. Wow. Well, I'm happy with that. I think that is uh, some pretty good evidence that uh, this technique works. <laughs> and it allows us to see pretty good views into what the processor is doing. I'm really happy with this. Uh, what are loads? Sorry, I'm trying to figure out what you're analyzing. Loads could have so many meanings in computer science. Uh, I'm leaking all of the memory accesses from the Intel processor. So I'm basically uh, trying to determine the order and the contents of all of the memory accesses that occur uh, on the CPU. So it's just, in this case, it's just 64-bit loads on the processor. Nothing, no, no special meanings there. But yeah, we were able to, to leak all of those and figure out the ordering that they came through, even though we used completely random values. Uh, I think, I mean, that's, that's the biggest, this is like the biggest data sample I've done so far over the course of 2,500 cycles. Uh, and it was accurate. I think that is really cool. And that's probably where I'm going to wrap this one up. I can't get much better than that. Literally a perfect result. Uh, over 128 loads. So, yeah. I think I'll be, uh, I think I'll be using this tool for some, some really fun stuff. All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Actually, anyone have any questions before I go, before I head out? Might as well answer questions or if people want to say anything before I leave and go eat my dinner. It's actually, the stream actually went longer than I anticipated. The results were much better than I thought. <laughs> all right, chat seems quiet. I think I'm gonna call it. See y'all around.